Okay. Try to refresh or do it again. It, it will work. It's going. It's uh it says it's streaming. Yes, that's good. Yeah, it's it's fine. Um You're on now. yes. Yes, I see that. Uh oh. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. That was interesting what just happened a few minutes ago. Welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O. Um, Good evening. You know, I'm a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I treat addictions in Maryland. I enjoy coming to this forum every week because I learned so much. And also have the opportunity to impact into our participants. So... I'm grateful to be here and to today present one of our own that I'll call my daughter that I just met. And <laughs> that is Dr. Olutayo Shoguro, who is a general, uh, actually she's a breast surgeon who did general surgery before, trauma surgeon in her past. And now um, a breast surgeon um, with outstanding education at the Georgetown University, presently working at Johns Hopkins hospitals in Baltimore and um, Howard County. I'm going to defer to her to complete a robust <laughs> introduction. So she's going to talk to us, though, about things to do with the breast, breast cancer, that is impacting our populations, both in the U.S. and out of the U.S. Uh, so much recently. I can tell you stories after stories of people with breast cancer, both here and um, back home, at least in Nigeria, that has not been the case in the past. So I'm hoping that we will get some education in prevention, treatment, and all that has to do with breast cancer. So without much ado, Dr. Shoguro, the floor is yours. And welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. O. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Dr. O said, my name is Olutai Ozoguro, and I am a surgeon by training. I um, did training in general surgery and um, practiced doing acute care and trauma surgery for um, a few years. And during COVID, I decided to change my specialty and actually went back and did a fellowship in breast surgical oncology um, at Georgetown University, which brought me to the DC area. And um, I am an assistant professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins University, and um, I treat exclusively breast patients. Um, I take care of both benign breast disease, so non-cancerous patients, in addition to the bulk of my practice is taking care of breast cancer patients. So we get referrals from um, all around the United States and from the world, um, patients that come to Johns Hopkins that um, I get the honor and privilege of taking care of. So um, today I'm going to um, share with you really a, um, I hope, robust um, background on breast cancer. I think breast cancer is one of those things that we talk about a lot, but sometimes we don't really get a great understanding. And having a platform like this with a lot of medical professionals and non-medical professionals to really be able to take the information and relay it to their patients, their family members, and their loved ones. So we'll talk a little about what breast cancer is, triple negative breast cancer, some of the disparities in the treatment of breast cancer, and what are these risk factors that we can really modify and those that we can't? And then what can we do about it? What can we take from this talk today and charge ourselves with um, to make a difference? So when we talk about breast cancer, it's really important to understand that breast cancer is a disease of uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells, okay? On the left side of your screen here, you can see, um, sorry about that, you can see that you have um, the kind of what we call the side view if you're looking at a breast. This is your the back of your body, these are your ribs, um, and your um, 
the ribs in your um, rib cage, okay? This is the front of your breast and this is your nipple. So when you cut the breast in half, most of the active breast tissue are lobules and ducts, okay? The rest of our breast is just fatty tissue for the most part or connective tissue. This tissue right here, these lobules and ducts are responsible for making the cells that make the milk and ultimately putting the milk into the milk ducts and then milk will come out of the nipple. That's a purpose of the mammalian breast, us as mammals, okay? Now, whenever something goes wrong in terms of cancer, it is usually of the lobules or of the ducts. So it's of this tissue right here that's problematic, okay? It's a tissue that's working the most and the one that can have a problem. Just like if you think of a factory, everything in a factory is working right, you know, until the conveyor belt goes out. So I always say to my patients, think of cancer like a process, like the conveyor belt going out and something developing in the lobules or ducts. Cancer is a malignant process, which means that not only is it a cancer, but it has the ability to spread. It has the ability to spread outside of the lobules and ducts into the rest of your breast tissue and into the rest of your body. And like I said, in terms of where it begins, it's in the lobules and the ducts. So that's a quick and dirty anatomy lesson, okay? I won't do too much for those of us that don't love anatomy. So when we talk about the malignant process, we need to talk about tumor progression. Cancer starts from an abnormal cell. So right here, like I said, this is that factory, right? Everything looks normal. Okay, it's working as it is. Then all of a sudden it's working faster. The cells are starting to grow more, but now they're starting to become abnormal in appearance. And then they become more abnormal and then they develop into a cancer cell. Now, when they're a cancer cell and they're contained inside the uh, cell, inside the walls of the cell, we call that in situ disease. In situ means in the cell. When the cancer has broke free, from the cell membrane, so that capture, um, that um, area that's capturing everything inside, when it breaks through, then that becomes invasive. So then it's going to invade the tissue around it. So this is in situ breast cancer, and this right here is invasive breast cancer, okay? This is what has the potential to spread outside of the breast into other tissues, such as your lymph nodes, and therefore become something that can spread to other parts of your body. So, why do we talk about breast cancer so much, right? It's gotta be important, we're talking about it, um, but really why, why are we doing it? Well, in 2023, it's still prevalent as the highest incidence of, breast ca of cancer cases in the United States. So this is something that's important to understand. Most of us may know this, but just to recap for those that don't, there are two big uh, two big terms that you have to understand, and I have it on the top right of the screen here, as you can see. One is incidence. Incidence is a term that we use for the number of new cases of a disease in a year. So we're talking about breast cancer today, so I'm talking to you about the incidence of breast cancer, but it's important to understand that incidence relates to any type of disease process. For example, in 2020, we talked about COVID, right? So we would talk about the incidence rates of COVID, right? In 2020, we had the highest incident rate of COVID-19 that we've ever had in history, hence the pandemic. So incidence is the number of new cases of a disease in a year. So according to the CDC, the breast, breast cancer has the highest incidence of all cancers among women. As you can see, breast cancer is number one, then there's lung cancer, colon cancer, uterine cancer, and it goes down from there, okay? So the incidence rate is about 129.7 for 100,000 patients, okay? Now, the other term that's important to understand is mortality. So I said incidence is the number of new cases per year, while mortality is the number of deaths per year from a disease, okay? So even though breast cancer is the highest incidence, it's not the highest mortality rate um, amongst all cancers. So when you look at cancers, the ones that kill the most, it's actually lung cancer. That's for both men and women, okay? So lung cancer is the number one cause of mortality, but breast cancer is right there underneath it, okay? The mortality rate of breast cancer is 19.4 per 100,000. That's followed by colon, pancreat pancreatic, and ovarian cancer. So compared to the others, other take out lung, breast cancer is very high. Um, it's almost twofold higher than colon cancer in terms of the death. So 
now we're talking about incidents. We're talking about mortality. I want to give us a little bit of some good news as we're going forward, okay? So looking at the annual rates of cancer deaths, the mortality rates over the last, you know, two decades, fortunately, we're making some headway. As you can see, our death rate has steadily been declining over the last two decades, which is really good. Now, the reason why this is happening is because of breast cancer screening initiatives. We have screening mammography, which is available to patients, and that's really helped to decrease that death rate. Why? Because breast cancers can be caught at an earlier stage and therefore be treated, and patients can have a better um, prognosis. So there's some good news in this, right? Now, I gave you a lot of numbers and a lot of data. Sorry, my mouse is jumping here. Um, a lot of numbers and a lot of data. So what do these numbers actually mean to you, right? So if you had to translate these numbers, well, in the United States, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is one in eight. So that's 12.5%. If you round that up, that's 13%. That means if you have a room of 80 women, okay, one in eight of them is going to have breast cancer. Okay, that's a lot. If you have a room actually just of eight women, one of them is going to have breast cancer. So just by being born a biological woman, we have a 13% risk of developing breast cancer. That's not even including your family history yet, your reproductive history or anything like that. That is just by coming out of the womb, a woman, you're at 13% risk. Screening, we looked at those numbers over the last 20 years, screening has decreased mortality, the death from breast cancer by 25%. That means that one in four of those women will be spared. Their mortality rate has now decreased by 25%, which I think is incredible. But keep in mind, this is in the United States. This is not worldwide. Why? Because we don't have worldwide screening programs that are or access to screening mammography in all countries. Um, even in the United States here where we do have it, Mammography is not perfect. Screening is not perfect. 10% of breast cancers will be missed on a mammogram. 10% of breast cancers will not be seen on mammograms. There are multiple different reasons for that. One of the big reasons is I told you before that we have lobules and ducts, those two types of um, cells that make up our um, breasts. Ductal carcinoma, which is cancer from the ducts, that's the most common type of breast cancer. About 85% of our breast cancers are ductal. About 10 to 15% of them are lobular. And just by the nature of the lobules, they don't form to, they don't tend to form calcifications. And so mammograms are essentially x-rays, right? And they see calcifications and they see um, uh, that kind of um, abnormality on the, the imaging. So if you don't form calcification, sometimes it's very difficult to see a mass until it's already become a large mass on mammograms. So for lobular carcinomas, uh, mammograms are not the best imaging modality because they tend, they can be negative um, in about 10% or more of patients. So I gave you the numbers in the United States. So I wanted us to make sure, you know, we are relevant to our audience today and talk about what some of these numbers look like in Nigeria, okay? So breast cancer is on the rise in Nigeria. This is information from a study that was actually just published in 2023 by Olaide et al. Um, in um, the Asian Pacific Journal of Cancer Care. And they were looking at, they actually did a systematic review and meta-analysis, which is one of the first actually of um, available data in the um, Nigerian um, literature. And they looked at the um, number of new cases in Nigeria in 2020. So they had 28,380 new breast cancer cases in 2020. And that was about 22% of new cancers. And, high, and that was the highest proportion of all cancer types. So similar to the United States in terms of the incidence, breast cancer was also the highest in, in Nigeria. And then one of the things that was very important is that when we look at Africa as a whole, Nigeria has one of the world's highest um, age standardized mortality rates of breast cancer um, in the world and the highest in Africa. Um, so that's really concerning. Um, that's very concerning for us. One of the things to keep in mind is that we're saying that it's the highest in Nigeria, but when we talk about data and research, we have to understand certain biases that are available. So we, uh, in Nigeria are one of the most, if not one of the most um, developed nations in all of Africa. So we are able to actually collect this data. So 
In other countries in Africa, the rates may be a lot higher, but there's just no mechanisms to actually collect the data to even get that information. So I just say keep that caveat in mind um, as a possible um, data collection bias as we're actually able to collect it so we can make that, um, make that assertion. So when we're talking about breast cancer, I think it's really important to understand when we talk about these receptors, right? A majority of us here have probably heard people say, oh, you know, hormone receptors or um, estrogen positive or progesterone positive, and there's a lot of terms that are used. And so I like to explain it in a really simple term for everybody. So we have three main receptors when it comes to breast cancer. On these cancer cells, there are three main receptors. One is a hormone called estrogen, another hormone called progesterone, and one is a protein called HER2, or the human epidermal growth factor. So the way to think about these things is if you think of the cancer as um, a cell, okay? The cancer is a cell and think of it as a house. Now to get inside and destroy the cancer, we must bypass these locks on the front door of the house. So the locks are estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. If your cancer tests positive for one of these three locks, which are known as receptors, then we as doctors, as physicians, have some keys that we can use to get inside the cell and destroy it, right? So if your um, house has an estrogen lock, then I have a key that can open the estrogen, right? AKA a medication that can use to target that. If your house has a lock for the progesterone, then I could use my progesterone key to get in there and use it to destroy the cancer cell. And the same with HER2. So we call those targeted therapies. We have over the last 30 to 40 years in medicine have developed targeted medications for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 in the breast, okay? So if you're ER positive, PR positive, or HER2 positive, um, and it's breast cancer, well, you know, we have targeted therapies for that. So people tend to have been doing um, a lot better and the mortality rate has decreased because not only can we do screening, but we also have targeted therapies. So now what happens when you don't have any of the locks? You've now locked yourself out of the house, right? So triple negative breast cancer lacks the three main receptors. It does not have estrogen, it does not have progesterone receptors and it does not have HER2 receptors. So we call that triple negative. It's negative for the three main receptors. So we can't get into that house to fight the cancer, okay? What does this mean in terms of the disease? Well, it means that this cancer is more aggressive. It means that the cancer is faster growing and it means that it has a way worse prognosis. Okay, so triple negative breast cancer is the most aggressive type of breast cancer that we have. And even though now, based on the last three to four years, we are starting to develop some more immunotherapies, we still have not figured out the best way to treat this disease. We're still working on it. So it is the most aggressive cancer. So who is getting triple negative breast cancer, right? Because I now just said it's the most aggressive. So who's getting it? Well, we are. We're getting it. We know that about five to 10% of breast cancers, um, closer to that 10% number is hereditary, which means that it is um, passed on from, from genes and passed on from family history, about 10% are. But most breast cancers are actually de novo. Um, what we mean by de novo, which means a random mutation happens. So patients will say to me, well, I'm not doing a mammogram because no one in my family has breast cancer. You know, I, I'm not at risk. Well, most cancers actually happen by spontaneous mutations. Most breast cancers are actually not even hereditary. The hereditary ones are definitely hereditary, but you can get breast cancer even without having a family history. Just by being born, like I said, you already have a 13% chance. So that's a myth that I like to bust very commonly. Now, women who are under age 40 are the one of the highest groups of women uh, getting triple negative breast cancer. Black patients, African-American, Black patients, and Latino patients are very high um, risk for this type of breast cancer as well, and those who have a genetic mutation. It is so important, and why knowing your family history is important, because you may not know that you're at increased risk for something if no one talks about the disease, and we'll talk about this a little bit coming up, but patients who have certain types of genetic mutations particularly BRCA1. So you may have heard of some of these genetic, genetic mutations associated with breast cancer. 
BRCA stands for breast cancer gene, okay? So we have a BRCA1 and a BRCA2. Patients with a BRCA1 mutation have a very high risk of developing breast cancer um, and particularly triple negative breast cancer. So we've looked at patients who had a BRCA1 mutation and we looked to see which type of breast cancers they have. Those who have a BRCA1 mutation, 70 to 80% of those breast cancers are triple negative, okay? So it's really important to understand your risk um, and know your family history. So what are some of the disparities? We've talked about who it affects, right? So we know that already, but why? Why is that happening? You know, um, why are white patients, you know, not getting triple negative and why are they having more hormone positive? So what do we know so far? Well, we've done some studies. In the United States, we did a study um, several years ago, um, the Carolina Breast Cancer um, Study that looked at breast cancer in young patients that were really recently diagnosed. And what they found were that these patients tended to be black and they were young or premenopausal. Menopause, for those who may not be familiar, is that um, you know age um, that women tend to um, decrease their um, their ovarian estrogen production and eventually stop having their um, menses or their periods. So that age, on average, is about age fifty. So these are in patients who are under age fifty. They tend to be black. These patients had their tubers diagnosed at a higher stage. When we talk about the stage of breast cancer, breast cancer stages range from zero to stage four. Stage zero is the lowest stage. It's when the cancer is just in the cell. It's so low, it's um, the earliest stage of breast cancer. Stage four is the highest stage of breast cancer, which means the cancer is actually spread to all parts of your body, other parts of your body outside the breast. So we found that these patients, even though they were getting the triple negative breast cancer, it was at stages three and four you know, and high stage two. They were, at the time they were diagnosed, it was already advanced breast cancer. Um, we found that these patients um, were twice as likely, black, a young black woman was twice as likely to have a triple negative breast cancer than a white woman was. You know, these are st startling numbers. So going back to the cancer death rate, and I'm sorry that I feel like I'm talking about a lot of death, but I think it's really important for us to understand because this disease is killing us. So when we talk about the death rate of breast cancer, I showed you some slides earlier. The death rate, also known as the mortality for breast cancer, was 19.44 per 100,000, okay? So if you look here, this is for all women. The death rate is 19.4. If we look here, this is the death rate for Black women, 27.8, okay? White women, so the average death rate is 19.4. Everybody else is below the average. Every other race is below the average. And we are 1.5 times. That's startling. Now, I didn't show you this large slide just for the incident, you know, just for not having too, too many slides and um, too much data. But I think as a scientist and a researcher, data is really important to me. And I think it helps people understand um, the, the, the impact of a disease. So I talked to you about the death rate. Well, let's talk about the incidence rate and the incidence in the different ethnicities. Black women are not the highest incidence of breast cancer. White women get breast cancer more than black women do. The incidence of breast cancer is 135.2. White women are getting breast cancer more than black women. If you look here, white women are at 135.2, black women 128.4, these are per 100,000. And then um, Native Indian, Asian and Pacific and Hispanic are in the tens, okay? Um, and so now if you think about it, white women have the highest incidence of breast cancer. This is new cases, yet, their incidence, I mean, their death rate is below average. Black women are the second highest right here for the incidence, yet our death rate is the highest. My mom is a math teacher, so she's going to say, <laughs> Tayo, something, the math is not right. It's not right. You know, what's happening, right? Why do we have a disparity? You know, as some people will say, the math is not mathing, right? 
So the annual rates of breast cancer, like I said, over the last 20 years, I said everybody overall, it's been decreasing, right? I said there was some good news. Yet the rate for deaths of Black women is gone up. So something doesn't make sense. Do you not agree? So why are these things happening? Well, there are lots of different, um, different theories and different social determinants of health that are important to understand. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into exquisite detail, but two major things that are important to understand are socioeconomic factors and environmental factors. Socioeconomic determinants of, or socioeconomic determinants of health are economic, social, physical conditions in the places where people are born, where they live, where they work, and where they play that can affect their health and quality of life. You know, there are multiple things that go into this. There are cultural things, behavioral things, psychosocial things, behavioral things, um, sorry, uh, biological things, um, environmental things. So a lot of these things come together and create significant health disparities that really cause a disproportionate um, number of one race or ethnicity over another dying from a disease process. And that's clearly evident in breast cancer. Some of the really important things that we found, there was a, a study in 2017 looking at um, those um, factors of what was accounting for these disparities. So they looked at patients aged 18 to 64, and there were four important things that were found. These patients had a lack of private health insurance. Their tumor characteristics were worse. So like I told you before, that study that just found that the patients with triple negative breast cancer had a higher um, had a higher stage. They were diagnosed at a more advanced disease um, state. Um, they had more comorbidities. And also there were differences in the treatment in which they received, in the treatments that they were um, they were privy to, that they were um, that they had the um, access to. So these are really, really, um, really important differences that have been found to attribute to some of those um, differences in mortality. So let's talk about risk factors. We've talked about the disease process, we've talked about some of the disparities, and we've talked about triple negative breast cancer. So when we talk about breast cancer in general, I like people to really understand that risk factors fall into two groups. Risk factors can be modifiable, which are things that you can change, okay? And risk factors can be non-modifiable, which are things that you can change, we were born with, okay? So let's talk about the things that we were born with and we can't really change, right? Then we're gonna really focus on some change. So one of the things that we can't change is our age, right? Even with all of our, you know, wonderful skin products, you know, all our, we all can do tummy tucks and breastless and all this stuff. At the end of the day, God still knows our age, okay? So we can't change our age, whether we try to or not on paper. Um, and our genetics, you know, we can't really change our genetics. We can't change the fact of who we're born with, right? You know, we're born into who we're born into. Um, and we can have family members who have breast cancer and we can't change that necessarily, but we can change the information and what we do with it. Reproductive history. We can't necessarily change that, um, but I put it in both categories because there's something important to know that when we talk about the risk of developing breast cancer, the risk is really associated with your lifetime exposure to high concentrations of estrogen and progesterone, okay? When you have a child under the age of 30, we found that when you have a child under the age of 30, it's actually protective for breast cancer because you decrease your lifetime exposure. The longer you, so by having, by ha getting to partition, by getting to delivering of a child, you expunge a lot of hormones at that time. You expunge a lot of estrogen and progesterone. So you actually decrease your lifetime exposure. If you kind of think of different curves, you're going to decrease that curve with pregnancy. And then if you breastfeed, those things are protective as well. You're going to decrease your, um, your lifetime exposure to estrogen. So by having children at a younger age, we found that it's actually protective against breast cancer. By not having children, so being what we call nulliparous, not having um, any children actually puts you at a higher risk of breast cancer. Um, your breast density um, is something that you can't necessarily change. The density of your breast relates to how much of volume of lobules and ducts that you have in your breast. If you remember that picture I showed you earlier, looking at the side view of the breast and you have the lobules and the ducts, the more lobules and ducts you have, the more dense your breasts are. The less lobules and ducts you have, also known as the more fat you have, the less dense your breasts are. As we grow older, 
our breasts become less dense because we now have less lobules and ducts because our body doesn't necessarily need to produce milk. But you can't necessarily change that ratio of lobules and ducts. Your body will naturally. So that's why women, as we age, our breasts sag, right? When we were younger, our breasts were, you know, hanging, sitting up there. They were really dense. And some of us, you know, didn't even have to wear a bra, right? But as you get older, that's not the same anymore because you don't have those lobules and ducts that are lifting the breasts up and making it dense. You have mostly fat that has replaced your breasts. And that's why um, your breasts sag. So breast density is something that you can't really change, but physiologically changes happen as we age. Then your um, family history, right? You can't necessarily change that. And some things that people cannot um, change are their exposure, exposure to radiation and certain previous drugs. DES was a drug that was used in the 60s and 70s. It's not really used anymore, but some have a history of exposure to that medication. And some people live in parts of the world where there's a lot of background radiation that's very high. Some people live near power plants and live in very, um, you know, uh, poorly, um, you know, poor environmental um, areas that radiation exposure can be very high. So those things can increase your risk and are non-modifiable. But there are things that are modifiable. For example, physical activity. So physical activity is associated with your risk of breast cancer because, um, and this kind of ties into the next thing in obesity. People think that um, estrogen and progesterone is just from your ovaries, right? Sure, the largest production in our body as women is in our ovaries. However, um, we have um, certain aspects of our body that store estrogen. Adipocytes, the fat cells that are in our um, abdomen, our arms, anywhere, excess fat stores estrogen, actually, for long periods of time. So you can actually have excess estrogen stored in your fat. And that's why physical activity is really important. Um, and we say, you know, it's important for all disease processes, but including cancer. Um, maintaining a healthy diet and weight is important to decrease your storage of estrogen and therefore your risk factors for breast cancer. Um, the use of hormone replacement. So a lot of, um, there are a lot of reasons why people use it, but one of the most common ones is when women are going through menopause, a lot of women end up using hormone replacement because there are a lot of uh, symptoms associated with menopause, like hot flashes, weight gain, you know, vaginal dryness, lots of different symptoms that women have. And, and um, sometimes it's very difficult to, um, to um, maintain a regular um, lifestyle with those symptoms. And some women choose to go on hormone replacement um, to replace their loss of um, estrogen. And that can actually increase your um, risk for the development of breast cancer. There are different studies out there. Some studies have said that, you know, a lot of the hormone replacement that's used now does not increase as significantly as it did 20, 30 years ago when we had really high unopposed estrogen um, in the hormone replacement. So overall, though, we still do consider hormone replacement therapy to be a risk factor for the development of breast cancer. The um, degree of that changes with research all the time, but we still do consider it a risk factor. Um, and I talked about the reproductive history again, you know, like I said, I put it in both categories because, you know, not everyone can have children, right? So it's very easy to say everyone should have a child if they choose to, but for some women, unfortunately, they can't. So I put it in both categories of modifiable and non-modifiable. Another thing is excess alcohol intake. Um, alcohol does affect your risk for development of breast cancer too because of the um, the induction of um, free radicals and things like that that it does and it changes cells. So it's really important to understand that. Everything in moderation, you know, nothing has changed. Eat well, diet and exercise and stay healthy. Those things are really important things for the risk factors. So, now, these, this is the homework assignment for everyone today. What is it that you can do? What I want you to take away from this talk. Number one is mammograms should start yearly at age 40, okay? It's really important to understand that. There are different um, bodies of, um, of recommendations out there. And in the United States, our recommendation is for mammograms to start annually at age 40. I'm not saying to start at age 40 because, um, or age, say, oh, I'm going to start at age 45 because I don't have a risk. I don't want to hear it from anybody to tell me the reason why they're not going to start at age 40. Everyone should start at age 40. That is average risk. If you have a first degree relative, um, you need to talk to your primary care physician or um, provider because you may need to actually start mammograms earlier. We recommend 
that if you have a first degree relative who had breast cancer, let's say, for example, your mom or your sister or someone had breast cancer at age 45, we actually recommend to start screening 10 years earlier than the youngest person that had breast cancer. So you would actually start your mammograms at age 35. OK, so age 40 is for everybody. The latest any woman at average risk should be starting uh, mammograms is age 40. First degree family history, it may need to be earlier. Um, one of the things that I think, um, Dr. O, you and I were talking about this that's important is, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, questions and, and thoughts around, you know, well, if I'm doing my mammograms all the time, doesn't the radiation from the mammogram itself increase my risk of the development of breast cancer. So I think it's very important to understand some numbers. So when you do a chest X-ray, you know, if anyone has ever had to be in the hospital, you've had a cough or anything like that, or had a family member have a chest X-ray, the rate of radiation from a chest X-ray is about 0.1 millisievert. So MSV, okay? That's a unit that we use when we're talking about radiation. Now, the... Radi that's the um, amount of radiation in the background. So normally just by living in a industrialized world, you are going to actually be exposed to 0.1 millisieverts of radiation every 10 days, okay? Just by living in a, in a, um, in a civilized nation. Now, if you live in some third world countries, it's actually gonna be a lot higher than that. There are certain places in India and Asia and even in Africa that the background radiation is a lot higher than that. Now, a mammogram exposes you to 0.4 millisieverts, okay? So which is about the normal amount that you would get over about five to seven weeks, you know, just by walking around and living life in an industrialized nation. Now, there, has, there are studies that have been done that have looked at the risk of radiation inducing breast cancer from screening mammograms. And that number is actually very small. So it's actually less than 0.1%. Um, so it's been about 86 per 100,000 patients. So when you do that calculation, it's 0.086%, okay? The risk of mortality, so basically patients dying from getting annual mammograms um, is 0.011%. So the number is less than 0.1% of the risk that it increases of you developing breast cancer. When you compare that to the risk of developing breast cancer just by being a woman, it, that's 13%. So yes, there is a very small risk associated with um, the radiation that you get exposed from a mammogram, but that risk in comparison to the risk of breast cancer and the risk of dying from breast cancer is very, very small. So um, we don't recommend that patients make decisions on not getting a mammogram based on that risk. The benefit of a mammogram and the ability to screen and detect a breast cancer is, is, is 10, 10, tenfold or more than tenfold um, beneficial to not doing it. Get your annual physical exam. You need to see your PCP, okay? Dr. O, I hope this makes you proud. You know, patients need to come in and get their annual physicals. Why? Because someone needs to do your breast exam, right? So you need to be seeing your annual, um, you can get your annual PCP exam. And if you're a woman, you really should have a gynecologist as well. And so the exam, whether it's the, by your gynecologist or your PCP, should include the palpation of your breast every year. If you have a doctor and you're a woman over age 40 and no one's done a breast exam for you, then you've had a disservice and a, an injustice. So make sure that you're talking to your primary care physicians about that. And if not, talk to your gynecologist about it. And if not, you come see me in my office. We will do a breast exam because that's so important, okay? So your annual physical exam is important for the breast exam, but also to make sure that you're meeting the targets, that you're you know maintaining a healthy weight, that you're discussing risk factors. You know, some people are Smokers. Some people are drinking alcohol and need help with, um, you know, stopping those things. So seeing your primary care physician is super important and um, I can't, you know, um, value it enough. This one right here, know your family history, please, please, please. This is, this is probably the most important thing that I can um, bestow onto everyone today. Not to know is no degree is, is is not to know is no disgrace, but not to want to know is a shame. Okay. So it's one thing if you don't know your family history, but to choose not to know it um, in cases where you can, it's a travesty. I have patients who have breast cancer and did not tell their siblings and not tell their children. Okay. What you're doing 
as much as we want to, sometimes we think that having a cancer or having a disease process is something that we did to ourselves, you know, and most of the time it's not, you know, it's not a shame. In our culture, unfortunately, we carry it a lot of times as a shame and it should not be a shame. You should actually take it and be, have it be something that empowers you because by having that information and sharing it with your family, it allows them to be able to do something about it. I cannot tell you how many patients I have come to find out after they've had their own cancer diagnosis and after their treatment, then they come to find out, oh yes, my aunt's told me that she's had it, then her sister's had it, then like eight people have had it. And now you're 45 and we could have been screening for you when you were age 30, right? And found out that you had a BRCA mutation or something. So don't leave out information because you are ashamed or you don't want someone to know. Trust and let your family members know because by them having the information, then they can do something about it. It's important to know that when you're talking to your doctor, make sure that they, you talk about all of your history because you may say, oh, I'm only going to tell them only the breast cancer is, but actually a lot of cancers are related, right? I need to know about the ovarian cancer history. In fact, I need to know about the men. I need to know because men can get breast cancer too, right? I also need to know about pancreatic cancer history. I need to know about prostate cancer history. Why? Because those four cancers are actually linked, right? Prostate cancer is linked to BRCA mutations. Pancreatic cancer is linked to BRCA mutations. Ovarian cancer, breast cancer, they're all linked. So don't necessarily leave out information because, oh, you think it's not important. Let us decide that, right? Tell us all of the cancer history so that we can make the appropriate judgments and um, a treatment plan for you based on that. What you can do is do monthly self-breast exams. Think about this um, as something that you're going to do. You can do it in the shower. You can do it, you know, wherever, once a month. Um, and check your own breasts and palpate. You know, you can go in a circular motion. You can do it by quadrants and feel for any lumps or bumps. A lot of patients are going to say to me, well, I'm not a doctor. How am I supposed to know what I'm feeling for? You're not supposed to because then you would be a doctor, right? But you know what you're going to know? If something is new from the last month, that's what you're going to know. You're going to know if there's been a change in your breast. Mm, this lump wasn't there last month right? That's what you're going to know. And you're going to be able to alert um, a physician and get that checked out. I always tell people, think of it as your breast bill, okay? If you pay your bills at the beginning of the month on the 1st or the 15th or the 30th, whatever that day is, I call it pay your booby bill, okay? So that's a day that I'm going to do my breast exam because it's like another bill. If I don't pay the bill of my own health, I can't pay any other bills, right? If you don't take care of yourself and take care of your health, who are you? You cannot take care of anybody. So I always remember that. And that's why this little picture looks like you're paying some bills. You have to pay the bill of health to yourself in order to pay the rest of your bills too. Educate yourself on breast cancer. One of the things that I always tell people is, you know, everybody is an expert now, right? We have the internet, Google everything. Everybody knows everything. Everybody, you know, we all have the WhatsApp groups. We all share information. Everybody and their mother and daughter and sister and aunt is an expert on everything. Please, please, please go to reputable sources. I don't want the link from auntie so-and-so that said this and she saw that some doctor said this and said this. No, no, no. Go to reputable sources. Look at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, the American Cancer Society, the Susan J. Komen um, Foundation for Breast Cancer. These are the really big institutions in the United States. Um, but across the world, you can look at the World Health Organization. So make sure you get your information from reputable sources because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I think it's really important for people to understand that. So with that said, I'm going to kind of wrap up um, this talk um, and then kind of leave it uh, some time open for some questions and some discussion. I hope, you know, you all take something from this today and we'll be able to help um, others who are um, dealing with breast cancer. Oh, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much for that wealth of information. Um, you know, I've said this on this forum a few times that there is only one physician and it is God Almighty. But he uses physicians like us, he uses, you know, tools like us um, to effect purposes that he approves when he chooses to. And that the information we give today can change tomorrow with research. 
So I give that disclaimer every time I have to present that I'm presenting this to you as it is today, as it is relevant today. Um, the U.S. PSTR that we primary care physicians follow mostly recommended that screening mammogram should be stopped at 40 and should be started at age 50. Um, some colleges, there were discrepancies. We discussed that actually on Medical Mondays three years ago. <laughs> we had robust conversations on that. Um, some say it should start at age 50, but guess what? June last year, you're right on the money. They changed that we should go back to screening at age 40, and but it should be done every other year. And the American Cancer Society disagrees. The American College of Radiology disagrees. They say you should screen every year. So again, there isn't you know, a quorum there yet. Now with breast cancer, before I go to everyone, so if you please put down the um, picture, the background, so that I can, you know, get the view. Fantastic. Um, for people who have questions, please raise your hands or put it in the chat box. So I just wanted to say also that for breast exams, I have not done a breast exam in clinic in a couple of years. The American Cancer Society does not recommend regular clinical breast exams anymore. And I just went to check as of December 19, 2023, that is still the case. They don't recommend routine breast exams, but I show my patients how to do their own breast exams um, when they come. I show it, but I don't do it on them. One of the reasons they gave then in the beginning when they scrapped this, as well as prostate um, cancer screening, uh, because I remembered always, you know, sticking my, my finger in the rectum, <laughs> and the hemocult pads I had to throw them away when they expired, you know, they scrapped that also because they causing unnecessary, they said, um, biopsies and stuff like that, and that most women find their own breasts lumps, which is true. Most women are the ones, women usually come and say that they felt a lump in their breast and then we examine it and then, you know, um, do imagings and stuff, and then find out that they have cancer. So uh, that is still, I don't know. We need to dialogue more on that. It's <laughs> debatable. In the, breast, in the breast surgical oncology world, we still recommend to do it, especially with the number of young breast cancer patients that we're having that actually aren't even getting screened at all, right? Because we're not, mammograms are starting at 40. They're not starting at 20s and 30s. Yet I take breast cancers out of 19-year-olds, you know? So um, that's why in our field, we're still recommending it. The literature, um, you know, things change. And the people that are influencing um, the the some of the decisions, they are they are recommending recommendations, but they're not necessarily like you've talked about, not necessarily accepted by all colleges, right? Um, so um, it's definitely important to talk to your physician about it. Exactly. Um, so I still have some to say, but I don't know, you don't know about NAPAC yet. I'll tell you about NAPAC. This is our um, Madam VP, also CEO of NAPAC CDI from California. She has a question. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. O. Fantastic, as always. Um, thank you, uh, dear speaker. Sorry I joined late, so I didn't catch your name. But uh, Dr. O mentioned, uh, yeah, thank you. Dr. O mentioned that some of the school of thoughts, you know, the oncologists or whatever, those, they don't recommend annual uh, examination, breast examination. Is this cost-related or do they feel like it's, it increases the exposure to it because I don't know the justification why they would not. Like the speaker just said, she's she's had to do a biopsy of a 19-year-old who had breast cancer. I mean, are they not ascribing the same value that women do to this situation? What is what, what would be their reason to be in disagreement with annual exam? Annual mammogram. Yeah, mammogram, yeah. And and even the exam. 
Yes. Yeah. So there are multiple reasons. There are cost related things, but, you know, not everything necessarily is um, dri driven by the cost. One of the big things that we found is the anxiety induction in the general population. So sometimes with with the doing the clinical exams on themselves, what we found is that the women don't necessarily get taught how to do them properly. And so then it leads to a little bit of increased hysteria and patients, um, you know, um, having um increased anxiety associated with um, clinical visits and, and, and um, seeing their PCP for things that are um, not necessarily pathologic, and then they end up getting more biopsies and it leads to unnecessary procedures. Um, in terms of the mammography, there has been concerns about the risk of radiation, but also the, um, the actual cost and impact on the healthcare system, right? That um, there are just not enough um, places where people people can get their screening mammography to do it for everybody every year. That I don't think is a great reason for why we should not be doing it. Um, another reason for um, the concerns are that it does lead to increase in number of um, benign procedures, right? So patients, a lot of times, um, will get these um, these screening images and then lead to diagnostic imaging, and um, and then they can have a lot of biopsies that end up being benign. So um, there have been some schools of thought that it leads to increased numbers of unnecessary procedures, but the overwhelming thought and in you know our large academic institutions and in our our the colleges that are directly treating breast cancer radiology um surgical oncology and things we look at it as the patients that we are treating every year the number of patients who have a risk reduction benefit in terms of the um of the ability to catch a breast cancer early that benefit way outweighs the risks. So that is why the every once in a while the data will change and the pendulum will kind of move this way or move that way based on the data for that year. But overwhelmingly, we are recommending starting at age 40 every year. Um, but the reason for the changes is data changes and it causes the pendulum to swing. And we're trying to de-escalate care, um, which means de-escalate the number of procedures that patients are having to go through and overall costs on the healthcare system and on patient um, anxiety in terms of self-reported outcomes. She's dry. Thank okay. you. I mean, thank you, ma'am, for that answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I was asking, does that answer your question? And I was muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. I was muted. I was talking and I was muted. No, I mean, it's just that I find it irritating when they associate costs to a lot of these decisions that they make. If it's something else beyond cost, uh, then, you know, everybody will make that decision, will prioritize that for themselves, particularly those who have history mm -hmm. of, or a family member with such exposure. So, but we just need to know that hey, just because you can afford it too doesn't mean you should go for it every year. Is on your left. Because Side North, Los because of other associated risk. So we have to weigh both the pros and the cons of um of you know being able to afford it versus exposing yourself to unnecessary risk. That's why I ask. So thank you, ma'am. You're very welcome. Just so you're aware, in the United States insurance companies have to pay for annual screening mammography starting at age 40. Okay. So. Um, I just had one and I have insurance, commercial insurance, and my copay was $240. So insurance company did not pay for it. Wow. Like they That's advertise large. that they do because they say it's your, it's your annual mammogram, you know, uh, this is free. I got a letter telling me that. But when, when I made up my appointment, I was told I have to pay 240 when I got there. And when I got there, they repeated it and I paid. Yeah, so, so depending on the insurance, so the act, if you're paying 240, then that means the cost of it is probably like $1,200. So you're paying the subsidized version. And our, there's a lot of um, advocacy that we're doing that they actually should be getting rid of co-pays. But so far, insurances are able to charge co-pays for it. They can't charge you the whole price of it, but unfortunately, they can still charge you co-pays. 
there's a lot of legislation that we're trying to move forward that to even get rid of that because everyone's copay is different, right? You were able to afford the $240. Somebody's copay, that could be their, their I mean, that, that's exactly. their groceries for the month and they may not be able to afford that. So on paper, they're paying for it, but they are still able to charge copays. You are correct. It was my insurance company that wrote me that it's time for your mammogram. It's free. So that being said, you have, thank you. You have ballet, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, that being said, do you know that also, um, oh, Dr. Jagbe has his hand raised. I think I'll defer to him. But I wanted to say that um, people who are on Medicaid pay nothing. They don't pay for insurance. I'm paying insurance. I'm working and I'm paying taxes and my taxes is paying Medicaid for people who, for whatever reason, they're not working and they have the free Medicaid insurance. And when I'm paying 240 for my mammogram, they're having mammogram for free. The system has to change somehow. The, the, our health system needs an overall. And, you know, that's a separate subject. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it but talk about this because I think about this a lot, that it needs an overhaul. It doesn't have to be free. Um, insurances like in Britain, that the healthcare is not as good as ours anymore because of that or Canada, but we we have to find a middle ground here. And, you know, I have some suggestions, but it's not for this platform tonight. Maybe we'll talk about health insurances sometime on Medical Mondays with Dr. O. Dr. Jagwe, pardon me. Go ahead, ask your question. Thank you, Dr. O. After stepping down from your soapbox, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Shoguru, thank you so much. I know uh, as a lecturer or as, a assistant, as an assistant professor, you have to break it down to, to easy to bite pieces you know, of information. So thank you for considering the uh, diversity of the population that you are presenting to. My own question, uh, it's not supposed to be complicated, but I just wanted to, wanted to hear what you have to say about it. As a pathologist, I've seen a lot of biopsies of, you know, breast tissues when I was doing my residency. And um, I know ductile, uh, you know, changes usually accompanies blockage, long-term blockage or prolonged blockage of the duct. So in your uh, recent understanding about the reason why the ductile uh, cancer of the breast seems to be higher than the lobular uh, cancers of the breast, uh, could it have anything to do with the blockage uh, and inflammatory process that continues to go on? I know we say we don't know exactly what causes cancer, we just know the associated factors, but I think prolonged blockage of the extractory ducts of the uh, breast have something to do with it. Uh, you know, relative difference in the incidences of the uh, two different cancers of the breast. Can you just comment on that? Yes, that's a great question. So um, like I said, ductal, thank you so much, um, doctor. Ductal carcinoma is um, 80 to 85% of cancers and uh -huh. 10 to 15% of cancers, like I said, for everybody. One of the um, things that we look at are, um, you know, the free radical damage to these ductal, to the ductal tissue. Um, and so um, you also have more ductal tissue um, than lobular tissue in our breast. And particularly in men, for example, men almost have um, no lobular tissue as, at all. So in fact, in men, even, and I, I, I'm remiss for not talking too much about male breast cancer today, Male breast cancer occurs in about, is less than 1%, okay? So men can get breast cancer. When men get breast cancer, it's almost exclusively ductal, 90% um, or more ductal because they actually don't form lobules as um, almost at all. 
So most cancers in women are, um, are ductal because we have more ductal cells. And then in terms of the damage that happens, those milk ducts, um, they tend to um, be influenced by more damage, right? So either from blockage, either from, um, from the atypia, the changing of the cells, um, that damage from um, cellular injury is worse at the ductal level. Um, we have um, something that is really important that um, is something that's important to distinguish um, ductal and lobular. Not only um, do the ductal cells um, tend to be more impacted by, um, by cellular changes, but lobular actually is a little bit more pluripotent than ductal. So what I mean by that is that a patient we have, um, I didn't show it today, but one of the things that I love to teach my patients is that I think of breast cancer as a spectrum of disease, right? So you have changes that happen and happen, and then it becomes an in, in situ disease and then invasive. Before you are cancer, you actually get atypical hyperplasia. So atypical ductal hyperplasia and an atypical lobular hyperplasia. So what that means is the atypia means abnormal cells and the ductal or lobular is the origin of the cells. And hyperplasia is the increase in the growth of the cells, right? So like a factory, I go back to that um, um, analogy that the cells are growing faster and faster until a mistake happens. So instead of now being all square shaped, now they start to be triangular shaped. Well, when you look at the ductal cells, atypical ductal cells, so when the cells are abnormal in the duct, they become ductal carcinomas, okay? So they follow that same trajectory. If you have abnormalities in the lobule, so abnormal or atypical lobular cells, atypical lobular hyperplasia can actually become invasive lobular carcinoma or invasive ductal carcinoma. It actually has a 50-50% chance of each, okay? So not only can lobular cells become ductal or invasive carcinomas, they also tend to be able to occur in either breast. So we actually look at lobular, um, atypical lobular hyperplasia and lobular carcinoma in situ as a marker for the increased risk of breast cancer in either breast. So lobular actually behaves very different from ductal. So lobular is even more tricky. It's harder to find on imaging, right? It doesn't show up on mammogram often. It's pluripotent, which means it can become a lobular carcinoma or a ductal carcinoma. And it tends to be present in multiple areas of the breast. We call it multifocal or multicentric. It's not just in one area. It can be in multiple areas. And it has a propensity to be in the other breast as well at the same time, okay? So lobular just behaves a lot differently and we don't understand why as much. Um, but we know a lot with the ductal cells and um, ductal cells tend to be impacted a lot more by those um, radical changes to the cell membrane um, and they develop into carcinomas usually near where they started. I hope that, yeah, is, um, that helps a little bit. Answer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually the way I, you know, uh, based on my own experience, uh, I can tell you that the uh, the appearance of the cells of the ducts are closer to the squamous cells than the glandular cells that are in the lobules. So the reason they are different in most cases is because one is glandular and the other one is excretory. So the one that is excretory doesn't have glandular tissue in it or glandular cells. So when there are irritations, just like what we have on the skin or in the mouth, when you have a, you know uh, any kind of repeated irritation that is not abated over time. And I see from the blockage of the ducts, which is occasionally going to precede formation of uh, stones or calcifications within the breast, and that also will cause the irritation of the lining of the ducts. And that irritation of the lining of the ducts is one direct, you know, associated factor in terms of the generation or the, the, or the beginning of cancer development. First of all, like you said, it will come, it, it will begin to increase in number. The number will then begin to differentiate into, so I mean, become non-differentiated, which means you can't recognize them anymore. They don't look more like uh, 
Doctor cells, they look strange. They have all kinds of shapes. That's why we describe it as pleomorphism. So when we use the word pleomorphism, we de describe them as though you can't see any particular pattern that you can that is recognizable, other than the fact that they are all haphazardly arranged. Uh, this the shape of the nuclear also the the brain of each cell also changes. They all look different. Some of them are very dense, more than the others. Some of them have big holes in them. All kinds of crazy things going on within the cells. Yes, oxidative oxidative stress has a major role in uh, starting any kind of you know cancer anywhere in the body not just in the breast, and which is the reason why antioxidants are always very advisable uh, for anyone to use, uh, whether you, it's a male or female, every one of us need antioxidants. And so um, while we remove the, the uh, oxidative stress problem by using antioxidant, stasis, that is the blockage of the duct, it's still something that needs to be uh, looked into very critically. And I don't know whether you agree to this, that the massaging of the breast has something to do to prevent, you know, uh, some of these things from going on. Because if the woman can massage their breasts continuously or regularly, there will be some things that, you know, there will be less blockage of the excretory duct of the nipples that actually causes the backing up into the breast. That's just some comment from, you know, my experience. Dr. Jagwe, knowing that you're a dentist, oral pathologist, and you did this in, in medical school or? No, I did that in, uh, I did that part of my residency in, in Georgetown. That is like 100 years ago, I give you kudos. 1,000 years ago. <laughs> Fantastic kudos. Thank you for remembering. Um, like we say in Yoruba, that you have amazing memory. Dr. Jagba, I give it to you. And <laughs> accurate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So what do you say to the massaging of the breast that he said? Is there any... Um, there isn't much in terms of evidence base to support it or negate it, you know, so by theory, it makes sense, but we don't have enough studies out there to be able to say based on this, you know, this is the percent reduction that we'll find from it. Um, theory wise, 100% correct about the free radicals and the damage to the um, ductal cells, 100% on that. And and also the chronic long term blockage that leads to, um, to, to transformation of cells is very accurate. Um, but the breast massage, there, it doesn't do any harm. We just don't know if there's enough evidence to show, you know, the, the major benefits, but I don't think it hurts at all. I don't think, I think it's a very good um, hypothesis. We just need to study it some more. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Buka. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Buka is... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Owen. Thank you to your lecture. I can never hear enough about breast cancer. Every day I'm learning something. And Dr. Dabe, it's just the hat that he wears that has all the information. Every week he changes it and it has more information. I cannot help but listening to what he has to say. But I do agree, you know, as an anesthesiologist, I look at the surgeon. Sometimes when we do too many um, procedures, not me, the surgeon does too many procedures, like benign procedures, sometimes you feel the scar tissue and people come back again because they think it's a lump. So that may be a reason why they're asking them not to do too many um, um, breast examinations because you see them, they come back and say, I still feel another lump. And it might be the scar from a previous surgery. So, but I just remember something somebody said about her. She was nursing her son and she was saying, why doesn't he want, and her husband said, oh, Maybe he could get some of the milk coming from me. And she was a nurse. She said, what? And when she sent him to the doctor the next day, he had breast cancer. And this is about 30 years ago. He survived it. 
And that's how she knew that he had breast cancer. So if men make these funny remarks, just send them for an examination. And, you know, I've never paid for mammogram. And my God, if they tell me to pay, I will call everybody in the insurance company. You know, I'm a Yoruba <laughs> woman with that. I won't stop. So <laughs> I have never paid for any. And they better not tell me to pay. Mm -mm. Because this was part of the work of, you know, primary care stuff for us. But thanks again. It's been a wonderful lecture. I'm really, I really learned and will sit back to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. See, in that instance, uh, in a lot of places, I'm not Yoruba woman because I don't want to fight. And you know, maybe, I, maybe I need to be Yoruba woman. And Tayo, I need to tell you this. She's from the Caribbean, but she's, she studied medicine in Lagos at Luz. She she knows Niger, but I'll be, she, that's why she said I'm a Yoruba woman. <laughs> She'll be a Yoruba woman and fight that she won't pay for the mammogram. She's right on the money. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, uh, Sister Karen, kindly unmute and ask your question. Sister Karen, kindly unmute. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Doctor. I um, I want to thank the um doctor who gave the presentation. So tired. And yes, um, I thought it was very informative. Very grateful for it. Um, I'm. I feel like the others. The more information we can get, the better off we are. I would like to, I'm with Dr. Booker, as far as mammograms. I've never had to pay for a mammogram. And I believe it's because it's supposed to be preventative health. And most things you don't pay for that are wellness that are preventative health. Now, I do understand that it, is probably more expensive than other things that are preventative health, but I have never paid for a mammogram. And I expect when I go for them not to <laughs> ask me for any money for that, you know. Sister Karen, um, on the forum, thank you for that um, contribution. Um, Dr. Lola said she had to pay copay too, but, um, Sister Olatomi said she's surprised that without insurance, she paid about $100 for a mammogram last year and about, about that the year, and, and, and about that the year before too. So um, I will look further into why I have to pay for $240. I didn't question it. I thought it was outrageous, it was crazy. I never had to do that before. I've been doing mammograms since I was 40 uh, because that was in the time when everybody agreed that we should start screening at 40 every year before things <laughs> went back up. And now hopefully there'll be you know better consensus um, on, on that. So I, I will look into it, but you know, thank you for that input. Because also, I really yeah. do need to look for it for my patients also. Just so everyone knows, Dr. Wood, it also depends on where you're getting it done um, because um, some of the locations have just different um, kind of reimbursement and bargaining things, you know, with the your insurance company. That's number one. I can also tell you advanced radiology, for example, um, there's something new with mammograms. Um, we talk about AI and everything like that. Um, and AI is becoming very integral in medicine, as we know, but one of the areas that it's becoming very integral is actually in mammography. And um, some of the, it's actually already been part of mammography. If you've ever had like a 3D mammogram with what we call CAD, computer detection, that was already, you know, using some AI to detect certain areas of um, increased density or concerns that will draw the radiologist's eyes there. But now with AI, they're actually incorporating a lot of it into um, the reading of an evaluation of mammograms. And I know, for example, um, advanced radiology is charging patients an extra forty dollars for the AI. I was going to say that they so, told it was forty dollars. So my copy was actually two hundred, but they asked; it's optional. 
if I wanted AI reading or if I didn't for additional $40 and I'm like, go ahead and do it. I mean, you're already charging me um, 200 bucks, so 240. And Sister uh, Sherry Shoguro said she never paid for her mammogram. And you're right on the money there. I always had my mammogram at American Radiology. But this time they said they didn't have openings and all that. Do I mind going to advanced radiology? They all want and the same. This is the first time I'm having it there. So that may be why. I don't know. Um, yes. She, 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 she said she declined it, that she never paid for mammograms. It's only $40. Um, so I still paid $200. So it's $240 I paid. But the AI was only forty dollars. So, um, so we move on from that. I will go research again why I had to pay that much. Doctor Izugu, Doctor Izugu is a cardiologist. Kindly unmute and ask your question. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Doctor Sungara. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Yeah. Uh, you broke it down where everybody can understand uh, science data you made it very simple that's really beautiful i have a, a small question uh, one is is there a cultural um issue that plays with mammogram like for let's say colon cancer screening or colonoscopy uh you know some men some black men may be resistant in those things because they just don't want somebody going some so you have to go through educating them culturally to really remove that bias, to get them to do some of this screening. Do we see that in mammogram? You know, and then also, when you come to, you know, sometimes some ladies, you ask them, have you done your mammogram? They say, well, it's very painful for them. You know, when they do this, so then they don't want to do it, you know, every year. They, so, you know, they, or they can't get an ultrasound because, you know, there's some reasons that they will come up. Of course, as a man, we don't know the answers to this, but can you guide us on how best to be able to encourage patients that we see in this process if there's any cultural bias here? Thank you, sir. That is a great question. And um, I will say what I encounter. Um, what's funny is Dr. Noah Owen and I had this conversation about some of the barriers that we have um, dealing with um, some cultural um, difficulties with our patients. So one of the big things I will tell you is that patients don't want to know the outcome. It's not necessarily that they cannot go get the mammogram, that they cannot, um, you know, withstand the pain and things like that. Some patients, they just don't want to know what those results are going to be, because if they know what those results are going to be, they're going to have to deal with it. Um, I find that a, and I'm still trying to really understand why, because it's not just in the African cultures. I have Hispanic patients. I have a lot of different cultural patients that have similar um, kind of aversions to wanting to do it. It's not wanting the result of that mammogram to disturb their life, to disturb the family they have to take care of, the husband they have to take care of, the mother they have to take care of, the father they have to take care of. If they do this test, then they have to find out these results. And if they find out these results, then it can affect them in some way, shape or form, and they don't want to know those results. Um, so that's the biggest um, cultural thing I'll find. And, I, and what, no, not only do I find that, then patients will now give me excuses, you know, as to why they do not need to get it, right? For example, I don't know anybody in my family shop where I hope that we don't have any problems, you know? I get that one all the time and I was like, oh, okay. So that one is something that we have, to, and I was giving those numbers today, just by being born, you know, I tell patients, and this is what you can share, with no family history, just by being born a biological woman, you have a 13% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. When you include your family history, then it goes higher. So I tell patients that, and I tell them that by doing the mammogram, you can catch something early and we can actually treat it. So that way, the thing that you don't want to be bothersome to your family or to stop you from having to work or doing your job can actually be treated. You know, I try and give it to patients in that larger, um, you know, um, bird's eye view to say, okay, this thing that was stage zero, if you, we did the mammogram regularly, we could have caught it at stage zero. Now this mm -hmm. thing is stage three or four. I've had patients and not necessarily just Nigerian, but West African, Cameroon, um, um, uh, Ivory Coast, things like that. I, I've been called from the ER, right? It doesn't happen often. That's one of the reasons why I love breast surgery. So I don't have many emergencies, but I get called and they came because they were short of breath, right? 
Do you know what their shortness of breath was from? It was from a large metastatic lymph node compressing their trachea. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Come to find out they've had a mass in their breasts for months, for years. That one's not even months. That one is years. And choosing not to do it. You know, these women are in their 60s. So um, I think the biggest thing that I find is that to not deal with something, it's easier to not go do the mammogram. So therefore you don't have to deal with anything that will come from it. Um, and so in order to overcome those barriers, education. That's why when Dr. O asked me to come on this platform, I said anything, absolutely. Anything mm -hmm. that I can do, especially to our, um, to our, you know, African um, brothers and sisters to really help us understand this because there's no reason why we should be dying at these ridiculous rates. There's no reason why we should be getting diagnosed at such higher stages if we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, so, um, and the other question you asked about pain, I think you mentioned that. That um, actually is, so that one is a legitimate concern. The mammogram is going to be compressing your breast in multiple different views. And that one is just a screening mammogram. If you found something that they needed to do additional views, you would have to get a diagnostic mammogram. And that one could be in another eight different compressions of your breast. So it can cause pain. And especially for women with larger breasts or more dense breasts, it can be something that's very painful and uncomfortable. So those things, I actually talk to my patients. And if that's been an issue for them in the past, then I actually give them pain medication in advance. Some patients mm -hmm. have some anxiety. I will actually prescribe Ativan or Valium and things like that in advance for them to do that um, because that can cause pain. But I always ask my patients to communicate with me and try to find what those barriers are because if those barriers are there, let me know what they are so I can help you with it. You know, I will literally send on the day that they see me um, like a, a prescription to their pharmacy that same day. I say, hold this for whatever day you end up doing that mammogram or that MRI, you know, and that way they have that medication that can either calm them or can help with the pain. So, um, you know, I do try and help with some of those things. And for anyone here who has patients who do complain of that, consider doing that. I do prescribe pain medication for them to have on hand ready to use. I usually tell them to use the night of or the morning um, of the um, the mammogram to help with that. I usually give them one for before and one for after because you know you're going to have some pain afterwards too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hear that all the time. But interestingly, I don't think mammogram hurts. It's an uncomfortable position. It compresses. And I think a lot of it is in the mind. It doesn't hurt in my opinion, but you're right, um, you know, to, to pre-treat and to assist the best way we can. So um, Dr. Aluya has his hand raised, is a national president for NAPAC, Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee. If you are not a member, contact me, you need to be, because it's the organization that puts us at the table, so we are not eating as crumbs. So Dr. Aluya, our president, kindly unmute. Yeah, thank you so much, as usual, Dr. O. We don't see uh, your face, do we? Bringing... We don't see your face. <laughs> no, because I, I, just come off, I just came off work, so. Okay, 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 it's all right. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I thank you once again for, for bringing these brilliant minds uh, off onto this platform so that we know that we have people like her who are standing in the gap for us. Because otherwise, how would we know, you know, of Dr. Songu, right? I hope I pronounced your name right. Shogun uh, Rao. Uh, thank you for coming. Dr. Daya. Shogun Rao, right. Uh, right. Uh, and thank you for, for accepting the invitation as well uh, to come on, uh, to speak to a uh, social uh, issue and, and understanding that it, it is, it's a big problem uh, amongst women and in our community as well. Um, and like the oldest, and I've said it before, there's an African habit that says, if you hear good news, you listen to both ears. But what you do with that news is what's most important. You don't keep it, you share the information and let people um, hear about it uh, so that we'll all protect our community. Because that's basically what we're doing uh, or trying to do here. Now, um, a couple of things that have been very disturbing as well. I mean, I ran a primary health ca uh, um, cancer program at uh, the New Jersey Medical School uh, uh, in Newark, New Jersey, something of its kind, never been done uh, before. And I was 
I'm amazed at the kind of cancer that's out there, but more so with the kind of cancer that's happening in our women younger, younger, and younger. Uh, but one of the things I must thank you very much as well is to draw that inference between breast cancer and prostate cancer. A lot of people don't put that together. And unfortunately, as the incidence of breast cancer uh, has gotten up and they're younger, so also is the incidence of prostate cancer as well. And the BRCA um, uh, mutation that you talked about is very common. And there's another um, a mutation that's not very well you know, documented. And, and that was actually picked up from uh, young women who uh, live in the northern part of Nigeria. And they've raised, they traced that all the way down to African-Americans here. And these women with that, I think it's P53, I'm not sure what, what the, 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 the what you call mutation is anymore, uh, but it's also it's, associated you're with- You're correct, it's TP53. Right, so, uh, and, and, and as a medical student in Nigeria and all that, I used to see, and I've said it here before, I used to see very young women who have seen some gating mass, meaning you can look through the breast and see the other side of the breast. But they're young and they're breastfeeding from the other breast to the other children. And, and I used to wonder, like, what the heck is this? What's going on? And, you know, with all the works that we've done here, linking that also with uh, the very aggressive prostate cancer that's happening here uh, as well, we're seeing that correlation. Now, um, two things, and I posted a question on the forum. Um, breast cancer has still been shown that women who breastfeed their children tend to have a lesser incidence of breast cancer. I'm sure there's a reason, uh, you know, uh, uh, association with that. So we often encourage our women to breastfeed their children. That's one. Um, two, one of the biggest concerns that always troubled me, uh, especially with a triple, you know, negative um, breast cancer, that's very aggressive, in, especially in our women, and Black women as well, is that a lot of women who have been cleared or been told, oh, you're breast cancer-free 5, 10, 15 years, and all of a sudden, something comes up. And that when it comes back, it's so aggressive, it usually takes them away in such a short time. What's your take on that? And how do we begin to truly you know, face such issues uh, and, and so that we can still continue to monitor uh, our women who have been so-called uh, cancer-free from breast cancer. Thank you so much, sir, um, for those questions. Fantastic question. So the first one to address um, your comment in the chat, you're 100% right. Breastfeeding is still protective against breast cancer, just like we talked about um, having, um, ha be having childbirth before age 30 those things increase your total exposures to estrogen because it decreases or expunges some estrogen from your body. Um, so by breastfeeding, actually it is protective against breast cancer. It helps decrease the risk of breast cancer somewhat. So that is very true. So breastfeeding is still very encouraged um, in what for women that can do it. Um, in terms of the triple negative breast cancer, you're very right. It is the most aggressive breast cancer and actually um, when we are able to treat um, patients um, with triple negative breast cancer and we can get them to, you know, have a complete response, right? So we treat them, they get their surgery, they get their chemotherapy, radiation, whatever it is, and they're successfully treated, right? Five years is the time that we kind of use when we're talking about um, the highest chance of breast cancer coming back. So if you make it to five years without breast cancer coming back, a lot of times you may hear people use the term a breast cancer cure, Right. But the thing that I'd like people to understand is that unfortunately we have to think of breast cancer as a systemic disease in terms of it, once it's treated, it's, it's gone sort of, right? It's what we call NED, no evidence of disease, right? We've done your PET CT scans, we've done all those, it doesn't look like there's any cancer anywhere in your body. Well, here's the problem. Because breast cancer is a systemic disease, um, there it can evade the immune system in so many ways. And of all the types of breast cancer that evades the immune, the immune system the most, it's triple negative. We have found that patients who have a recurrence, so when the triple negative does come back, they tend to actually have 
evidence of distant metastases, which means it's not in the breast, right? You could have been doing well for 10 years and all of a sudden you have a nodule in your lung or you have some deposits in your bone. So because it, um, it evades the immune system, it's been the hardest to treat. I'm gonna give you some good news. So the good news is for breast cancer, what we have been finding um, or what we've been doing over the last three to four years is um, really actually say over the last 10 to 20 years, but particularly in breast cancer specific, we have been developing immunotherapy, right? Because we figured that out, that it's the immune system that breast cancer is evading and particularly triple negative breast cancer, right? That doesn't have those particular targets. It's evading the immune system. So we have developed immunotherapy. One of the biggest things, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of something called um, pembrolizumab, or pembrolizumab or Keytruda, but it actually got FDA approved just at the end of 2021 to be able to be used in breast cancer patients, breast cancer patients with triple negative. And so this is still very um, kind of new on the horizon. So we don't have 10, 20 year studies yet because it just got FDA approved for the use of breast cancer. What I can tell you is, um, immunotherapy has been getting used actually in other cancers like lung cancers before, because believe it or not, what people don't realize is actually lung cancers express HER2. That protein um, is actually expressed in lung cancer as well. So anyways, we are um, doing more and more immunotherapy and we're developing more and more drugs. We're actually developing things called um, antibody drug conjugates now. So they're, met, they're chemotherapy combined with an immunotherapy together. And we're looking at those things and really seeing what the effect is. Unfortunately, we're not going to have data for about five to 10 years on what the longevity um, of those are and what that um, what that looks like for, you know, um, overall survival and recurrence. But I'm very hopeful and I love that's why I love being in the field that I am, because we continue to find out things every day and we continue to learn, OK, what is it that we're missing and where is it that we cannot um, treat this or we cannot treat that? So what can we do about it? So immunotherapy is on the forefront and it's on the horizon and it's here. Um, we have um, clinical trials. So one of the things I um, want to impart on everybody is that please make sure that your patients and your, your loved ones and things like that know if they're not somewhere where they have access to clinical trials, they need to find it and they need to talk to somebody and they need to search for clinical trials. Black women have dismal rates, basically very tiny representation in clinical trials. And I say to people, how are we supposed to know the medications and the drugs and things like that are going to treat us if we are not in the studies? So in order for us to be in the studies, we need to know about the studies and enroll in the studies. Um, so there's actually um, a um, an organization, and I know the um, the CEO of it. Um, her name is um, Ricky. So it's called When We Trial. I'm going to actually put it in the chat. And um, it is helping Black patients, Black women and men, enter clinical trials and learn more about clinical trials and increase the number. Ricky and her organization have actually over the last several years, increased the numbers to over 10,000 Black women in clinical trials for breast cancer, which is fantastic. So in order for us to be able to decrease our recurrence rate, decrease triple negative coming back so aggressive 10, 20 years later, we have to be in those trials that are testing the medications, that's testing the immunotherapy. So um, we have clinical trials available at Hopkins. We have clinical trials available at a lot of institutions. But if patients are getting care at smaller places, they may not know about it. So go to that website, share it with your friends and family. It's called When We Trial. Um, and I know the, the leader personally um, because um, I want to help her in this mission to make sure that Black patients are in these trials so we can get more immunotherapy available to treat us, right? To treat our um, the cancers that our patients are getting. Um, so that's a long-winded answer, sir, but I hope I answered your questions and um, hopefully we'll be able to make some more headway and progress in the next 10 to 15 years with the new drug medications that are available on the market. Yes, you have. Uh, and particularly for the fact that you brought up the issue of clinical research, uh, it's imperative that we have to get in by all means necessary and on all levels. And we are the ones who are standing guard uh, in the medical field, that would have to educate our patients and make them feel comfortable uh, as we do our research as well, so that they can be enrolled in the safest and best form of clinical trials uh, that can yield results. Because like you said, and I've said it before, how the heck do we know that this medicine is really working for us if we're not in those trials? And hopefully, 
in the not near future with AI, we'll be able to justify um, those proteins that make those triple negative um, breast cancer evade the immune system. Because once we're able to tag them and, and find, you know, a way of tagging them, and then, you know, we'll get AI to help uh, bring down those data early on out for us. So, we're, we're, yes, it's very optimistic. Uh, we have to get into, in the game. Uh, we have, we need black representatives in those spaces. And that's why we encourage our young ones to get into medicine. You don't have to be a doctor holder a test stethoscope. You can go into clinical research uh, as a doctor as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you sir. so much. That was key. Um, I have a question in the in the chat box, and I wanted uh, I want to quickly ask it before I bring Dr. Jagwe back on. He has his hand raised. Um, this is a sister, darling sister, said she had stage one breast cancer, went for lumpectomy, chemo, and radiation. She's currently on anastrozole. She hears a bones crack when she walks. What can she do to help with this? So great question. I always preface that, you know, I, if I'm doing a talk, I will give general information um, because I don't have an established physician um, doctor oh. or patient doctor relationship, but. It's a disclaimer. I had to say it before and after. I usually forget. This is a forum where we are not establishing patient physician interaction. It's a forum for dissemination of knowledge, sound, ungent, correct medical knowledge but we're right. not publishing care. Thank right. you. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, so I will give a general answer to that. So um, anastrozole is um, an aromatase inhibitor. So it's a type, you know how I told you guys that we have the keys to the house. So anastrozole is a medication. That's one of the keys to the house if you are estrogen positive or, or progesterone positive or both. So one of the, and we use anastrozole usually in patients who are postmenopausal, so usually after age 50. Um, anastrozole, one of the side effects of anastrozole is it causes bone breakdown. Um, so patients who already maybe have some underlying osteoporosis or bone problems can actually, it can be worsened with anastrozole. Now, the benefit of using an aromatase inhibitor is so important, right? Um, Endocrine therapy reduces your chance of breast cancer recurrence by about 50%. Okay. So that's why it's, 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 it's instrumental, right. In the keys of that house. Now, one of the things that you can, that you can discuss with, um, with your, um, physicians and providers are because we know that it causes bone breakdown. So people will lose calcium, um, and, and things like that. We actually have medications that help counter the bone loss associated with it called bisphosphonates. And those things help kind of build up your, um, your calcium stores and help reduce bone loss. So I would talk to your, um, physician or provider about some medications that can help, um, ameliorate or decrease the bone loss associated with that. Um, some of the medications are called, the, the group of them are called bisphosphonates. And I also recommend patients, you know, we recommend vitamin D, calcium um, that you can take over the counter yourself. So increasing those will help increase the, um, the stores of, um, of calcium and vitamin D that are lost from the bone breakdown associated with anastrozole. Another thing important with the aromatase inhibitors to know, if you haven't already, most likely you need to discuss this with your physician, is that we do what we call DEXA scans. So basically we're looking at what your bone density is, right? Because if you're losing bone at very high amount, uh, very high rates, they may need you to take you off the medication. So those are things that they monitor you on that medication to monitor the rate of bone loss that you may be having. So if you are having those symptoms, I strongly recommend to discuss it with your physician um, and some changes may need to be made to your um, to your clinical regimen. Um, but there are medications that can help, but you do need to get evaluated to make sure that the level of bone loss is actually not surmount, you know, more than the benefit of the medication. Because with too much bone loss, it increases your risk of actually falling and having a fracture, which can actually be very detrimental um, of breaking bones. So you do need to talk to your physician. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Jagbe, you can unmute. Please, I, and... thought, I thought I'm already unmuted, so hold on. Let me see. You are muted. You are. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, thank you again. Um, you know, I have two things that I wanted to comment on. One, 
is um, the influence of hydration on the rearrangement of cells. I'm not sure many people understand this. But anyway, uh, there is a study that was published recently in 2019, February, that actually was investigating the influence of hydration on the uh, the beginning or the uh, onset of breast cancer, uh, long-term dehydration. And it's published, it's published in uh, National Library of Medicine, so you can check it out. So using some new techniques, some uh, very high falutin X-ray techniques, sacks and wax, they were able to at least begin to look into that direction that common things occur more commonly. That's the way we teach, you know, I mean, we used to teach in uh, pathology that common things always occur more commonly. But most people don't even look at those common things as possible sources of problem. So dehydration or hydration is now being looked upon in the area of the beginning of breast cancer. So there are people who will say, well, I can do without drinking water. Many people, many women, because they don't want to use public toilet, they don't want to go to use a roadside restroom, so they will not drink. So many people do not hydrate the way they should. So some of these things are going on. So I think it should pique our interest. So that's the first comment. The second comment is about bisphosphonate. If anybody is taking bisphosphonate, you, you have to be careful because if you go for any uh, dental work that is invasive, the bone will not heal. The bone will become necrosed, will be, I mean, will rotten. So that's a real dilemma for anyone who wants to go on bisphosphonate they need to do all their dental work before they get on that medication. Because if they start, they can't do any, if they need extraction, it's not gonna work. The teeth has to be taken out though, but the jaw bone will not heal. So for those who might be on uh, bisphosphonate, be warned. And uh, please remember to tell your dentist before you go for any extraction. So they will know ahead of time that there will be complication if they do not know that you are bisphosphonate and they are finding out later on after the extraction is done. It's going to be a big problem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. That's very important information, actually, to think about some of the effects on dentistry and things like that. So thank you. Thank you. So um, before I look at other questions and all. I just want to say that on the forum, um, Sister Flo said, wow, thank you. Dr. Lola said, awesome, thank you. Thank you, wow, what a great breakdown of information, thank you, and I agree. I've never seen this presented like this before. Breakdown, straight to the point, I mean, um, Fifth grade level, like we ask doctors to do. Speak to us at fifth grade level so we can get it. You did that. You achieved that tonight. Thank you. So uh, Sister Shadi said, great information, Dr. Tayo. Amazing. Wow. Dr. V said, absolutely amazing. Well done, Dr. Shogunro. Sister Umi Kamsen, they all from California now, said, that was awesome, Dr. Lutayo Shoguro. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, Sister Adiola Atekoja said, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. And um, then we went on to more questions. I just, want, I just wanted to do a stop there to appreciate you and to say that people are really appreciative. Um, Sister Kea said it is recommended to do clinical breast exams before starting hormonal birth control. Um, yeah, it doesn't hurt. It's necessary 
because you know there is association correct of birth control pills with uh, breast cancer and, and not just the association with breast cancer, what um, birth control can actually do is it can change the composition of your breast, even not necessarily um, um, causing breast cancer, but there are a lot of other masses that can develop that are not cancer. So mm -hmm. um, starting, one of the biggest things I see is when women change their birth control pills, all of a sudden they're like, I feel a cyst, or I feel a mass in their breast. So it's the change in the, the um, birth control pill that can change the composition of those lobules and ducts in your breast and the fat, the fat the fat ratio. Um, and so it is important to know what your breast kind of felt like before. Um, and that way, if you change your birth control pill, you can know what it feels like after. So very great comment. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Sister um, Romoke Dasola said, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, some facilities like community hospitals offers mammogram to the uninsured at a very discounted rate as low as $50. Thank you so much for that information because that is true. If you are not insured, actually there are community health centers and hospitals that actually do this all year long. That mammogram, colonoscopy also are free. You know, even less than, you know, $50, they are free. So you just have to search and look, they exist. Um, Dr. Ethel Isiano said, thank you, Dr. Shogunro for an excellent presentation. And Dr. V said, Dr. Diet is solution. Dr. Diet is solution. She's asking if diet is a solution to prevent breast cancer. So it's definitely one of the risk, uh, modifiable risk factors, you know, diet and maintaining a healthy weight um, and physical activity. So absolutely. Um, some people will ask me all the time, are there some foods that I should not be eating? You know, what should I not be eating? So I tell patients that we don't have great evidence for um, specific foods to say this, if you eat this food, it's going to cause breast cancer. If you eat this, right, there's lots of um, different studies out there that we're still trying to evaluate it. But I can tell you that um, there is one particular food that we have um, well established very well. Um, it's um, soy products. So foods that are very, diets that are very high in soy, these are particularly associated with, um, with you know, vegetarians. So there's some people who eat like tofu every day. So we actually, we, act, we actually have found that soy products have um, high phytoestrogens. So they're plant-based estrogens that um, are in very high concentrations. And those have been associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So you want to avoid foods that are very rich in soy. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't have soy anytime. I'm saying for the people who are having soy um, in three or four um, meals a day, right? So everything in moderation. But the one food that we have found a strong association with is foods rich in phytoestrogens, plant-based estrogens, and that would be soy. So food rich in plant-based estrogen, like tofu, should be decreased, should be minimized, correct? <laughs> Especially if you have an increased risk of the development of breast cancer. So I tell my patients who obviously see me, they either have it or they have a high risk for their family member. I will tell them at this point, you've now been diagnosed and they'll ask me, what should I do? And I'll tell them if, you know, I'll ask them about their diet and we'll talk about that. Make sure that you decrease um, the, the, um, the, the amount of soy intake. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And you did say during your presentation that um, obesity is a problem. Um, weight loss is very important because obesity has been linked to breast cancer. It has. So uh, Sister Kain, they said, for ladies with larger boobs, like Dr. Um, Shoguru mentioned, it can be an uncomfortable feeling, but just for a short while. It was true for her. And she would like your contact information, please. Um, yes, absolutely. I'll provide that. Thank you. So, um, yes, it is uncomfortable whether you have large boobs or small boobs. Mammogram is not comfortable because it squashes, it pressed your breast down. What I'm saying is that it's not as painful as a lot of people make it out to be. But if you go do your mammogram when you if you are when you are menstruating or around your menses and you have fibrocystic breasts. Um, disease syndrome, when you have all these um, <laughs> lumps during or around your menstrual period that hurts, it would hurt like hell. 
So that's not the time to have it then. So um, Mr. Zubair joined from Nigeria. And I saw Dr. Um, one of our doctors, dentist also, who is from joined from London. Um, I don't know if he's still Dr. Okbayemi Adewale joined from London. And there are some others from Nigeria from London. Welcome. Thank you, he said Dr. Veronica, my second mother. <laughs> Good evening, Doctor. Um so Dr. Veronica said, wow, thanks for your dedication to medical education. Completely free too. And, you know, it's thanking you. And um, when we trial, that was you. So that's, the, that's what to search. The website to search for research. When we trial. Go ahead. Yes, that's the organization that's really actively trying to educate, um, especially patients of color on clinical trials and how to get involved in them and um, how to really um, understand them and um, basically be be kind of like a resource for that. Um, and like I said, I know um, Ricky very well, and I think she's doing great things. Um, it's been fantastic. So I've met with her personally, um, trying to work on, you know, ways that we can work together to get more people knowing about it. One of the things is I tell people about getting involved in clinical trials as, um, as patients of color is really important. It's very important. The time for the time of Tuskegee is past, which is what caused black people not to want to do research. This is not that ask us, ask, you know, even on this forum, you see the research, ask us, we'll look at it and we'll advise you, please, let's all get involved. You know, the researches will show what the kinds of people they're looking for. And if you fit that criteria, please enroll. It's very important. Um, since I know, I just said Georgetown University is actively conducting outreaches on this, especially for black women. Please, let's get involved. And Dr. V said, great news. Thank you. And uh, one of the things I just want to add is, you know, I just like to make sure that people understand that everything that we have today that we use had gone through a clinical trial. I'm sure everybody on this Zoom today has either used Tylenol or has a friend that's used Tylenol or Panadol, right? Panadol, Tylenol, they all have to do clinical trials in order for it to be able to, for us to use today. So even Tylenol that we're using that we think was oh, just a simple, you know, over-the-counter thing, it underwent a clinical trial. So in order to get breast cancer treatment to be something so easy one day, I don't know if it'll ever be over the counter like Tylenol, but who knows, right? We have to do these trials to get to that place. So remember everything that you use has, has had to have some sort of clinical trial. So, And as you said before, we are at a disadvantage when we don't participate because for instance, um, the symptoms of heart attack, it was white males that were used for this research. It was not too long ago that when they now researched again and you know had more people, blacks, women, women were not even <laughs> were not even there. They found out that the presentation of white women, even black women, black men, differ from white men. So, and we have to rethink things. It's important that we participate in research. Again, thank you. Mr. Zubar said today's call was top-notch one of the best he has ever seen, your presentation. So, and um, thank you, Zubair, <laughs> for thanking me. Uh, Sister Flo said, wow, thank you. Dr. V says, falls under my question above on diet. That a question is, can you recommend any diet to help prevent breast cancer? It wasn't clear in the first question. You just said D diet. Um, so like I said, I would recommend any well-balanced diet. Um, one of the big things that um, that I touched on earlier was um, free radicals, right? Free radicals, um, medication, uh, foods that are really high in free radicals can cause um, there to be, you know, changes in our DNA. 
Sorry about that. And so one of the things that's really important is that, um, you know, we have been doing a lot of research to look at some of the foods that are really high in free radicals. And, um, you know, there is not a direct association yet, but if you want to associate something that can cause free radicals to something that can therefore induce some cancer changes, um, we talked about processed foods, right? A lot of foods are processed um, in a lot of more developed um, countries, believe it or not, um, that have the facilities to process the foods um, in mass production. So processed foods tend to have higher amounts of free radicals. Um, foods, and when I say processed, I mean, for example, if you're buying like sandwich meats and things like that, things that are processed. Um, another common thing is foods that are nitrogen nitrogenated. Um, so um, that have a lot of nitrogen, so a lot of smoked meats, you know, it's one thing to smoke meat on your own, but foods that are kind of like smoked commercially um, and packaged and things like that. There are a lot of preservatives and things like that are put into food that actually um, have a lot of free radicals in them. So really, um, a um, I've always been um, told by a lot of um, nutritionists and things like that I've worked with. And one that I really, one term that I really like to use is eat low to the ground eat low to the ground. So the natural fruits and vegetables, right? So things that you can get from the ground, things that are natural and healthy, right? You know, you can't really buy bologna. You can't really find bologna in the ground. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, so foods that are um, natural, healthy, and free of um, processing are the best things to incorporate in your diet. Um, things, foods that have, um, you know, like low glycemic indexes. So like that are fulfilling, but don't necessarily have as high in terms of carbohydrates um, and can really be, um, you know, filling, but also healthy. So healthy foods, less processed foods and foods that are rich in fruits and vegetables, because fruits and vegetables have a lot of natural antioxidant properties. Um, so that's another thing to increase the number in your, um, in your diet. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. V for, um, you know, cycling around to ask that Dr. Ajagbe. You have your hand raised. You are you are unmuted, sir. Yes. Um, still on the same uh, track as food or diet or nutrition. Uh, we've we've had several discussions on this uh, group chat or forum on uh, the danger of high fructose corn syrup. Mm. So if there's something to avoid, that is one. Uh, additive to food that needs to be avoided at all cost. Uh, soy is another thing because soy oil is one of the cheapest oils for those who run restaurants. So most of the restaurants use soy oil because it's more affordable to them and they make more profit. Um, so if you must avoid some of these things, you need to find out what kind of oil do they use to make their food? Uh, then the issue of association between high fructose corn syrup and the um, the um, the genesis of or the increase in uh, incidence of uh, cancer generally is associated with obesity across the board. Uh, I think the last speaker before you. De dealt with that as well. Who is a who, who is a pathologist? Uh, he addressed the fact that obesity across the board affects almost every cancer, but more so in female-oriented cancers. Um, so, I want to just reiterate the fact that high glucose corn syrup, as cheap as it is, is not very healthy for us. So it's best for us to avoid everything that has high fructose corn syrup, if we can. Absolutely. I, I agree with that 100%. It's a processed food. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And it's, it's in, if you're not careful, it's in those, uh, you know, drinks, sodas, you're muted, Dr. Jagwe. You're talking, but you're muted. You're muted. I think you were responding to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been hidden in everything. It's been hidden in almost every food, even in your French fries. 
the French fries that people, one of the reasons it's addicting is because of the high fructose corn syrup. You know, they use the salt, they sprinkle the salt afterwards so that you will not know that there was any sweetness or sweetener added to the French fries. It was a tactic. Everything was done strategically. But see how many people who love French fries. As soon as you smell French fries from one mile, you are running for that place. You want it fresh hot. You want them to get it. You want to wait for it so that it's so crispy. And the fact that you're chewing in that it's crunchy with the salt, man, there is something about that. And it's, they know that high fructose corn syrup is addicting, and so they introduce it to almost everything. So if anybody is asking what food should I avoid, well, at least any food that has those two things, soy oil and uh, high fructose corn syrup, you should just run away from it as much as possible. Thank now, you. many bakers, Many commercial bakers are now putting, they're now dodging the law. They are just putting sugar. They don't say it is high fructose corn syrup anymore. They don't say they added sugar to your food. So you have no, no way of knowing that this bread that you like so much, Pepperidge Farm or whatever name, the, the brand, you like them because they taste so, somehow. The reason they taste somehow is because of the spiking of the high fructose corn syrup, they studied it, they knew it. They mm -hmm. knew it before they started introducing it to the food. So, and then um, um, God rest uh, Dr. Bill So. This is something we talked about several times about the high fructose corn syrup, you know? And uh, so we shouldn't forget this. We shouldn't just ignore it. It's very, very important that we stay healthy for the future, I mean, the future that we represent, we need to be there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Aluya said, please take on your advice for the woman and family who have been newly diagnosed with breast cancer. How are they to prepare for treatment, options, diet, exercise, and mental health, etc.? Please take on. I guess it's saying that you should. What would be your advice for the woman and family who have been newly diagnosed with breast cancer? You know, in terms of how should they prepare for treatment, options, diet, exercise, and mental health? That's an important question because when somebody is diagnosed with breast cancer, you they think people think of just that person. The family also. Uh, very well impacted, especially the caretaker. So what's your take on that? That's a great question. It's kind of a loaded question. We've kind of talked a little bit about the diet and exercise aspect of it. Um, in terms of the treatment options, you know, when you go and you're recently diagnosed with breast cancer, it's important to um, get ideally treated at a center somewhere that is um a breast cancer center because they're going to have the resources to actually incorporate all of those into your treatment planning um mm -hmm. so for example you know i'm a breast specialist and i just see um, um breast cancer patients um and breast but i'm breast disease as well but just breast patients and so when you come and you're diagnosed with breast cancer in our center um you're going to um leave with you know information with my nurse navigator you're going to have the contact information for um for nursing navigation help we have a cancer resource center that you're going to um be able to actually have like um here at my um, office in columbia you'll get like six um you know short-term counseling sessions um for you and family family members, we have um, um, resources for um, caretakers of the patients. So um, how to prepare for that? I would say the first thing is if you have the ability to be treated in a cancer center, that's where I would be treated um, for my breast cancer. Um, because then you're going to have um, 
the treatment options discussed with you. Um, usually we'll have our radiology, our um, radiation oncologist, medical oncologists, and everything that are part of our multidisciplinary group. So that way we actually communicate with each other regularly. Um, we meet once a week, you know, to talk about new breast cancer patients. So you'll have a, a team that is of experts that are all in the same system and taking care of you together and communicating. Um, so that would be the first thing I would do. Another thing I would do treatment options is um, really um, get a second opinion. You know, um, whenever you go, when they, one of the common things about um, breast cancer, really any cancer treatment is it's very good to go to, a, to go to someone and hear, but go to two people and make sure that they say the same thing or very similar things, right? Um, that's the first thing, because if the things sound very different, then, you know, you may want to get a third opinion, <laughs> right? Um, so always get a second opinion um, if you can, you know, if you feel very comfortable with the first one, then obviously do it. But if you ever have any questions and say, mm, there's something that I maybe don't love or you don't mesh well, or you don't feel like you're getting everything you want, go ahead and get that second opinion. Um, so to prepare for that, go to a cancer center, get a second opinion, and really prepare your family, right? Let them know that you're going to be undergoing, you know, treatment. Breast cancer treatment is not a one-day thing. It's not a two-day thing. It's usually a month thing. If not, it's usually weeks, if not months, right? Depending on chemotherapy and radiation therapy, the additional therapies to it. So um, preparing for it, I would say, um, to make sure that you have the ability to um, get all the resources that you need um, for treating it. Um, you have the family support. And if you don't don't have family support, you let the navigators know to help you because we have a lot of systems, right? Some patients, for example, cannot, you know, don't have cars. They can't get to from one appointment to another because once you get diagnosed, doesn't mean that's the end of, uh, of, in, of testing, right? You may need to go get an MRI. You may need to go get your genetic testing. You may need to go get additional this, additional biopsies, right? It's almost like a full-time job in itself that you have to take time for work. You have to get to all these appointments. So um, let the cancer center know what some of your limitations might be from the social standpoint so we can help you with resources. There are lots of community resources for like ride chairs, right? We can help arrange you getting rides to the appointments, rides to chemotherapy. Um, we have different um, organizations that we work with that help you with, um, for example, now maybe you won't be able to work. You're only going to be able to work hard. 50% um, of the time. I've had patients who could not put groceries on the table, right? And they have kids. What are they going to do? So you have to, you want to be plugged into a center that can help you with getting those resources because we don't want people choosing between eating and taking care of their cancer. We don't want people choosing between um, paying the bills and keeping the light on and taking care of their breast cancer. So um, that's something that you can do. Um, in terms of preparing treatment-wise, if you are working, right, start looking into the resources that you have at your job, right? A lot of um, um, institutions um, have the, um, the opportunity for FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, right, where you basically will be able to leave for that period of time that you need to take care of your um, disease process without the risk of being fired, right? So um, those things we can take care of for you, right? You get your FMLA papers and um, you get, give it to your treating um, cancer center and we help you with the FMLA paperwork and the communication with your job about the time that you're going to need off. Obviously, we may not know exactly, but we can say, okay, but well, they're going to need at least six weeks here, then maybe we have to extend it a couple weeks wherever we can do that. But we can help you with those things that decrease your um, your chance of, of um, failure, right? When patients feel like they're going to lose their job, they're going to lose their house, they can't pay the bills, it does lead to treatment failures. Um, I'm trying to think of the other aspects of that question. So preparing for treatment, talk about diet and exercise. What was the other part of that um, question, Dr. O? Make sure I'm hitting all of them. Um, treatment options. So like I said, um, I think the biggest thing would be to make sure you get additional opinions and know that, you know, chemotherapy, radiation therapy are those things that are going to be um, done before your surgery, after your surgery, um, and if you're going to need them. Some of the surgical options um, will be dependent on, you know, um, or some of your need for radiation will depend on the type of surgery that you need, right? Lumpectomy versus mastectomy and those kind of things. So those are the things that you want to discuss with your um, with your treating physician. And really preparing for them is reading a lot of the information that you get provided at that visit because everyone's cancer and everyone's disease process is going to be different. So learning about the treatment options that are necessary for you um, are important. And you can learn that um, by reading through that information and reaching out to the navigation team that's present at that um, cancer center you're being treated at.
Um, mental health resources, like I said, big cancer centers with resources will have those available. And if not, you can talk to your primary care physician because there are counseling. Um, and then even just if you need to get a referral to a counselor, that can be done too. Usually it should be done through your um, cancer resource center, but if not, it can be done through your primary care physician as well. And I hope that kind of answers that question. It's a little bit of a broad question, but Doctor, oh, I think you're muted. I said exercise. <laughs> Not in touch on that. <laughs> you know, exercise, exercise is important. So coming back to this, Sister Matilda said, if we must avoid smoked meats, this is very important it's for us Nigerians, like smoked turkey, smoked dried fish, should we not eat them? Should we avoid them? Or should we boil them well, dump the water out before we now use it to cook, like smoked turkey? So again, it's it's moderation. So it's it's um, diets that are high in these um, foods. So um, you know, if you're a lot of the smoked meats and things like that that we're doing, there's certain amounts that we're putting in the stew, it may not be the entire meal, right? So, you know, small amounts, everything in moderation is okay. I don't believe that really um, necessarily boiling it and dumping out really changes it that much because the um, the nitrogen is actually in, in um, it's really infused in the food and it's actually caused like the the free da uh, free radical damage to the food itself. It's kind of like in the preparation of the food. Um, so um, by boiling it, it doesn't necessarily um, change it that much. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so it's really just a matter of moderation, you know, and I'm telling you these things as possible risk factors, but there's no direct causal effect. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. It's not that if you eat this, this is what's going to happen, right? These are just risk factors and things that we're finding can increase, um, increase the, um, the risk for certain things, but it doesn't necessarily mean, um, mean that it's going to cause a problem. Hmm. Doctor, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank uh, I thank all the uh, presenters for the great presentations. Uh, I would like to find out if there is any hope in the near future for solution to uh, this breast cancer. Because uh, I've you know seen a lot of people suffering through this uh, particular issue. And it looks like we have cancer cells in every single part of our bodies. What are we doing to find solution to this problem? It's been lingering on for so many years and I've been praying and praying and praying. You know, for example, uh, King Charles, he has a uh, prostate cancer, it's very scary to me personally, that if this particular cancer can visit him, it means it can go everywhere. Yeah. yeah, prevention is better than cure. But at the same time, uh, the medical field, maybe they should start working aggressively in getting things done to solve or to just tackle this problem. A lot of our women, mothers are suffering through this uh, devilish disease. So please let me know if there's any hope, you know, for us in this life. Mm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just in um, summary or general, I would just say there is hope um, in terms of obviously prevention is key, but there's some things that we just cannot um, prevent. But now that we have a lot of, um, a lot of new medications, a lot of new things on the horizon, we are finding that we are decreasing um, the mortality rate. Now, do we need to decrease the mortality rate in black patients? Like I told you guys, yes. But overall, we are finding, um, we're making headway in cancer treatment. And um, one day, I hope that we can find the cure to cancer. Um, and so that way, it can also just be like an over-the-counter Tylenol that you just have to take, right? So let's all hope that one day we get there. But um, yes, your sentiments are well-received, and we just have to to keep fighting and keep learning and researching to get the information to be able to to, to fight it. Our natural queen. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Um, our naturopaths claim that they have um, cure to cancer. And um, what's your take on that? We have to see research, right? I mean, we are allopaths. Show me and I'll believe it. Yeah, unfortunately, I still have a job because we we have not cured it yet. Um, so one day I hope to not have to work anymore and I won't have a job, right? And I won't have, there will be nothing for me to take care of. But unfortunately, we have not gotten the answer yet. We're making headway. We're doing really well. But unfortunately, cancer is not cured yet. Thank you. Dr. Izugu, you have your hand raised. Kindly unmute. There you go. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I have a more a question more to bring it back home to Nigeria. If we have any program in place to improve access to mammogram for people in Nigeria, and uh, if there are any NGOs that focus on something like that, or and if the National Health Insurance covers mammogram, anybody knows? Um. The National Health Insurance does not cover mammogram, as far as I know now. And there aren't many places you can have mammograms done in Nigeria. I know a group here that put money together and bought a mammogram machine and gave it to one of our past force ladies. I won't say which one. And the mammogram gathered dust. They never used it. Yeah. Never went into use. So... Dr. Izugu, your question is uh, is a fantastic one. I think going forward, we only just to, we need we need to all get together and see how we can change things, improve things, have places where people can go and have mammogram done. Um, Dr. Shogunro presented, you know, um, robustly, encouraging us to have mammogram done, you know, um, every year from age forty, and. Um, when you don't even have where to go in a country to do it, then how do you how do you do that? How do you screen? Oh, Thank you. <laughs> how do you screen? So we have our work cut out for us. Yeah. So I'm glad you are in the leadership in that. You know. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. You are leading that pathway. We're so, gonna find a way out of that. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, there's a question here that. Is breast cancer is breast cancer contagious? No, not contagious in terms of a communicable disease, right? You can't touch someone with breast cancer and get it, but it can be passed on in your genes, right? So um, you can get breast cancer from from family um, in terms of your your genetic um, makeup, but not um, communicable. You can't get it from touching someone or taking care of someone with breast cancer. God forbid. Otherwise, I would quit today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll be the first one to drag you out of there. <laughs> so um, this question is very passionate. It hits the heart. Um, Sister Sarah said she's African. Have a, uh, she had a four children between the before she was 30. Sorry, she's African. She had a, four children before age 30 and she breastfed them all. She had stage one cancer. She was diagnosed with stage one cancer in 2021. And she has completed the entire nine yards of care. Thank God she says that she's still here. Right now she's taking letrozole. Her two daughters who are 29 and 36 years old are her concern. She's of the opinion that they should get genetic testing. However, she was informed that they are safe. I don't know who will say that. Can you please comment on that? So again, I'm prefacing as I'm giving general information and not establishing a patient-physician relationship. But um, number one is if you got um, breast, if you got breast cancer and you were diagnosed, um, really anyone diagnosed with breast cancer, it depends on which kind you have. If you had triple negative breast cancer, we recommend genetic testing of triple negative breast cancer patients at any age. Um, if you have multiple family members with um, breast cancer, we recommend genetic testing. But to be honest, there are some very strict um, 
uh, indications for genetic testing based on our NCCN, National Cancer um, uh, Network um, guidelines. However, genetic testing is really available to anyone that wants it. You may just have to pay out of pocket. So uh, most um, companies, um, it'll be a $250 out of pocket fee if you want it, um, whether or not you meet the criteria for it through your insurance. So I will tell you that if you were diagnosed with breast cancer and if you were under age 50 um, with any type of breast cancer, you yourself should have had genetic testing, um, number one. Number two is um, your daughters, um, because you are now their mom with breast cancer and you were diagnosed, um, you're a first degree relative of them. So to them. So that increases their lifetime risk of developing breast cancer, likely puts them in a high risk. Mm -hmm. So what they actually need to do is most breast cancer centers, including my own, we actually have high risk breast cancer screening programs. Um, and in those programs, we assess your risk. We, um, you know, um, go ahead and start um, ordering your imaging. Um, you know, your daughters may actually need to have also MRIs involved in their screening, um, their annual screening. Um, depending on when you were diagnosed, they may need to start having mammograms before age four. Um, so one of the things that um, really important is um, talk, have your daughters themselves talk to their primary care physicians about their breast cancer risk and about you having breast cancer. Why? Because that will prompt their primary care physician to um, do a risk assessment on them and also enroll them in a high risk breast cancer clinic or breast screening clinic, like something like we have at our center and multiple breast centers have that as well. And through that screening, when you're enrolled in that, if we calculate your risk of a certain um, number, then we will order genetic testing for you and we will do do it for your for the for the your daughters. Um, right. So it's really important that they do talk about their risk. And um, I don't know enough information on this. It would, you know, there's additional information that we would need, but I would not say necessarily that they're completely excluded. Because you had breast cancer, they are um, very likely high risk breast can uh, high risk for the development of breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, and if you haven't done genetic testing already, um, then I recommend that you do it because if you're positive for something, they definitely need to be getting genetic testing. So thank you. Thank you so much. Because I I don't like that it's not necessary thing. So Dr. Booker asked if does yoga and medication help with breast cancer? It goes in line with Dr. Aluya still, you know, wanting to talk about, you know, exercising in the scope of all of this. Yes, those things all definitely um, help, you know, in terms of diet, exercise, and really physical activity. Um, and um, I wonder if maybe the, the um, Dr. Booker will also like meditation in terms of breast cancer. I think um, meditation, the, yeah, meditation. That's what I figured. So one thing I tell patients is um, that, especially my patients about to go through surgery, right? It's very nerve wracking. I'm seeing them and they're all freaked out, and I, you know, all the questions and stuff. I tell them that, you know calming yourself and getting ready for surgery um, is really important. And um, yoga meditation really helps because it helps decrease your cortisol levels, your stress hormone levels. So I tell them by me taking you to surgery, I'm going to cause stress, right? I'm going to cause stress on your body. So by decreasing the stress before we get to surgery will be really important. So definitely in terms of patients who are about to have surgery, it's really important. And yoga and meditation really helps just in terms of maintaining that healthy lifestyle and really being able to focus on healthy living and diet and exercise. So again, is there a direct causal study to show that yoga and meditation decreases your risk of breast cancer? No, not necessarily, but does it add to a active um, and healthy lifestyle, which we have found um, physical activity does help decrease your risk of breast cancer? Yes. So maybe indirectly, yes. Um, smoked fish. Somebody said here, Dr. Lola said, African smoked fish doesn't have preservatives that they do. So it's not the preservatives. It's the, it's the fact that when you smoke foods, um, you have it, you, it's, it's the nitrogen, it's the nitrogenation of the food that actually induces a lot of free radicals. So preservatives can definitely have the free radicals too, but, um, but uh, but um, nitrogenated foods um, is really important. And the reason why this is, it's not just African food, it's all nitrogenated food. So um, one thing is that's really high incidence, um, we have gastric cancer in a lot of Asian countries is very high. And one of the reasons is because of their ratio actually of the ingestion of nitrogenated foods, right? So we found that those things um, do lead to increased free radicals and cancer production. Um, so it's not just the preservatives, it's the nitrogenation of the food. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. 
So somebody's asking. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's asking for the YouTube page. So if you search Medical Mondays with Dr. O, uh, you'll get it. Dr. V, you have your hand raised. Please unmute. Thank <laughs> this is so much, Dr. O. Dr. Shogunro, thank you. Um, two things. Mastectomy. I have friends that have experienced cancer in different ways. Does that actually, as the media says, help eliminate the chances of them getting cancer? For example, if the children do the testing and find out that they are most likely will doing mastectomy actually make it go away? Then second question is, there's a lot of me you know, out there saying that cancer is actually curable by you guys in the medical field that are trying to avoid it so you can have business. And I'm not accusing you directly, but it's mythical, I think. But help me with these two questions. Thank you, Dr. Shogunro. Thank you, Dr. O. <laughs> Excellent questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, so I'll answer the second one first because it's a very quick and simple one. It's not accurate because, again, why doctors themselves are dying from cancer, right? So I feel like it would be a disservice for them to have a cure for something and not be able to treat themselves, right? So that's number one. Um, so that number two, in terms of, no, we do not have a cure yet. Um, and one day I hope that we do, but we don't. Amen. Um, then the second uh, or the first question that you asked um, about um, the mastectomy. So, you know, again, there's different, again, there's a lot that goes into decision making and things like that. So, um, you know, mastectomy itself does not cure breast cancer or prevent breast cancer. It reduces the chance of breast cancer significantly. You cannot completely eliminate. That's why patients who have cancer and they get a mastectomy can still get um, cancer that recurs in the chest wall 10, 20 years later because by removing the breast tissue, we can only ever really get 95 to 98% of all the breasts, right? There's going to be cells that you cannot see, right? It's on the skin, it's on the muscle, it's on things like that. So there's still, it's because cancer starts in the cells, you cannot eliminate every single cell, right? Unless you literally just cut off half your body, right? Which we can't, but we can reduce it significantly. And so um, mastectomy um, can have a significant risk reduction in patients who have um, a genetic mutation like a BRCA1 or BRCA2. Um, we recommend bilateral, so doing both sides um, mastectomy, we call it prophylactic, which means they haven't developed cancer yet, but we wanna reduce their risk. Risk reducing prophylactic mastectomy um, reduces the chance of you getting a breast cancer if you have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation by 95% um, or more, but it's not 100% risk reduction. Thank you. Wow. That is important information. Wow. Great question. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this brings us to Medical Monday's moment. Um, I'm just wondering on this platform, I'm coming back, Dr. Shogunro, for you to give us your, um, final, you know, um, summary, submission, what we need to take home with us. But before then, I'm wondering who has been on this platform since we started March 1st, three years ago every episode and I've not missed. Even I have missed. <laughs> I've missed an episode. A couple. I've missed more than one. Do we have anyone on the platform that have never missed a Medical Mondays with Dr. O? Okay. What about somebody who has missed maybe yes. two? Who? Let's see. Right. Who? Right. So. What about somebody who has missed maybe one or two episodes, but no more than that? Anyone? Any takers? One. Okay. Um, Dr. And Dr. Ajay, I've missed only one Medical Mondays episode in three years. That is amazing. I have a gift for them, a blanket, this blanket that I'm going to send to them 
to say thank you for being, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't even know the word because they are more than just supporters of Medical Monday's family. They are Medical Monday's family. We started this together. They anchor this every episode, record the episodes so that if something happens to YouTube, Facebook, that doesn't stream, we have that backup so that we can um, we can still have the episode. Thank you, Sister Tinoade. They are consistent. They are consistent. They are faithful. And they love us all because they want us to learn to better ourselves. I want to say thank you so much, Dr. and Dr. Ajay. God bless you. Thank you. They have also, on this platform, given away sphygmomanometers, you know, the blood pressure measuring machines that we gave away uh, for a while here. They donated them. And this blanket was just donated also for us to give away by my daughter, Laisa. Thank you. Um, Lady Anna says, humbled. Thank you all for the great job. Thank you for the great job. We appreciate you. So I'll get the blanket to you um, to say our thank yous. And next week, we will see who wins or who will get a gift for next week. Actually, till the end of the month, I'm sure we'll have something to give away. So that being said, I'm reverting back to you, Dr. Shoguro, to give us your closing remarks, your closing advice. And thank you so much for a fabulous, fabulous Medical Mondays presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you everyone for really staying on. And I mean, there's such a great audience and everyone really was quite involved. Um, and I just want to say that um, breast cancer affects so many of us in one way or um, or um, another. And we have all taken care of someone or have a loved one who has been affected. So if there's one thing that I can just say to take away from this is that breast cancer is a real disease. We are dying from it at um, high um, numbers in terms of um, minority women, and you can do something about it. We talked about the modifiable risk factors, and the biggest thing I can say is know your family history and talk about it if you know, um, if you if you have it yourself or you know someone who um, someone in your family who may be dealing with it. Make sure that you share some resources with them and share the. Uh, the education that you learned today because it can save somebody else. So do not hide any um, diagnoses of any type of cancer and discuss it um, with your family members and with your primary care physician so you can get the appropriate care and referrals. Um, because again, and this is something my dad has told me since I was a child, but just remember not to want to know is really not, um, is not an excuse. And um we have to make sure that we continue to educate ourselves so that way we can take um, we can take um, action for our own health and take responsibility for it. Because if we cannot help ourselves and be healthy, then you cannot help anybody else. So just remember that. So thank you very much, everyone. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be able to present to you today. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you. God bless you. And till we meet again next week, 